Hello, good morning, and welcome back to The Word on the Street 2020, our first ever virtual celebration of storytelling, ideas, and imagination. You're watching our Ideas and Imagination stream. All day long, we're running three simultaneous live streams with content for book lovers of all ages. Our digital marketplace is up and running at www.wordonthestreet.shop, and you can connect with us on Discord to chat about, to chat about this, panel and more with festival attendees, presenters, and exhibitors. We're very excited to get started. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that WAPS Toronto operates on land that is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabek and Allied Nations to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. We're privileged to live, work and create in this territory and we strive to act with awareness and solidarity. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy, wherever you're tuning in from. You can find more about your geographies at www.native-land.ca. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce our first moderator of the day, Gary Seliak byrne Carrie is an artistic, queer, and non-binary publisher and writer living in Toronto. They are the co-founder, CEO, and publisher of Augur Magazine, Canada's only SW, SFWA recognized pro-paying speculative fiction market, and co-director of the upcoming 2020 speculative fiction event, AugurCon. As a speculative fiction writer, their work can be found in this magazine, The Thames Review, and others. Welcome, Carrie. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks so much, Maya. I really appreciate it. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us. As Maya said, um, I'm really excited to be here and to get into this panel. Um, so today we are talking, let me see, one sec. Um, we'll be talking about the narrative geographic. So to give you a recall to the panel description, um, world building starts in the world we already live in. Hear from Silvia Moreno-Garcia, Tanaz Batina, and AJ Vrana on their new books and how they weave the places they call home into fantastic backdrops. All right, so for our panelists today, I'll read through their bios for you. Silvia Moreno-Garcia is the New York Times best-selling author of the critically acclaimed speculative novels Gods of Jade and Shadow, Signal to Noise, Certain Dark Things, and The Beautiful Ones, and the crime novel Untamed Shore. She lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. Welcome, Sylvia. Hi, thank you. For sure. Um, and then Tanaz Vatina writes books for young adults. Her latest book, Hunted by the Sky, is the first of a YA fantasy duology set in a world inspired by medieval India, with the sequel Rising Like a Storm releasing on June 22nd, 2021. Her novel The Beauty of the Moment won the Nautilus Gold Award for Young Adult Fiction and has also been nominated for the Ontario Library Association's White Pine Award. Her acclaimed debut, A Girl Like That, was named a Best Book of the Year by numerous outlets including The Globe and Mail, Seventeen, and The Times of India. Welcome, Tanaz. Hi. Hey. And then our third panelist. AJ Vrana is a Serbian Canadian from Toronto, Canada. She lives with her two rescue cats, Moonstone and Peanut Butter, who nest in her window side bookshelf and cast judgmental stares at nearby pigeons. Her doctoral research examines the supernatural in modern Japanese and former Yugoslavian literature and its relationship to violence. All right, welcome everyone. <laughs> I'm so excited to get started. Um, so we'll start off today by uh, going through some readings from your works. And I think we'll go in the order of how I just introduced you. So Sylvia, I'd love to welcome you to begin first, if you'd like to introduce your work and what you'll be reading. OK, thank you. Uh, my latest novel is Mexican Gothic. So I'll be quickly reading through this from chapter two. When Noemi was a little girl and Catalina read fairy tales to her, she used to mention the forest, that place where Hansel and Gretel tossed their breadcrumbs or Little Red Riding Hood met a wolf. Growing up in a large city, it did not occur to Noemi until much later 
that forests were real places, which could be found in an atlas. Her family vacation in Veracruz, in her grandmother's house by the sea, with no tall trees in sight. Even after she grew up, the forest remained in her mind a picture glimpsed in a storybook by a child, with charcoal outlines and bright splashes of color in the middle. It took her a while, therefore, to realize that she was headed into a forest, for the Triunfo was perched on the side of a steep mountain carpeted with colorful wildflowers and covered thickly with pines and oaks. Noemi sighted sheep milling around and goats braving sheer rock walls. Silver had given the region its riches, but tallow from these animals had helped illuminate the mines, and they were plentiful. It was all very pretty. The higher the train moved and the closer it got to El Triunfo, though, the more the bucolic landscape changed, and Noemi reassessed her idea of it. Deep ravines cut the land and rugged ridges zoomed outside the window. What had been charming rivulets turned into strong gushing rivers, which spelled doom should anyone be dragged by their currents. At the bottom of the mountains, farmers tended groves and fields of alfalfa, but there, there were no such crops here, just the goats climbing up and down the rocks. The land kept its riches in the dark, sprouting no trees with fruit. The air grew thin as the train struggled up the mountain until it stuttered and stopped. Noemi grabbed her suitcases. She'd brought two of them and had been tempted to also pack her favorite trunk, though in the end she had judged it too cumbersome. Despite this concession, the suitcases were large and heavy. The train station was not busy and was barely a station at all, just a lonesome square-shaped building with a half-asleep woman behind the ticket counter. Three little boys were chasing one another around, playing tag, and she offered them some coins if they helped her lug her suitcases outside. They did, gladly. They looked underfed, and she wondered how the town's inhabitants got by now the mine was closed and only the goats provided the opportunity for a bit of commerce. Noemi was prepared for the chill of the mountain. The unexpected element was therefore the thin fog that greeted her that afternoon. She looked at it curiously as she adjusted her teal colored hat the long yellow with the long yellow feather and peered onto the street looking at her ride, for there could hardly be any mistake in it. It was the single automobile parked in front of the station, a preposterously large vehicle that made her think of swanky silent film stars of two or three decades earlier, the kind of automobile her father might have driven in his youth to flaunt his wealth. Um, I'll stop there. All right. I can't hear anything, but I'm assuming um, somebody yeah, I can't hear. I, can't I apologize. Hear. I muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said thank you, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. And we will move right along to Tanaz if you'd like to give us a brief intro to what you'll be reading from and uh, begin your reading. Uh, sure. So I'll be reading a brief excerpt from my latest book, Hunted by the Sky. Uh, this is a book uh, set in a world inspired by medieval India. And it follows a girl named Gul who's uh, seeking vengeance against a tyrant king for ordering the murder of her parents. Uh, this passage takes place shortly after her parents have been killed and she's hiding in one of the landowner's uh, stables in her village. The wealthiest landowner in Dukal has gray hair, a greasy smile, and teeth that shine yellow in the light of the furnace he holds over his head, flames dancing in the lantern's clear glass confines. I peer at Zamindar Mulchan through the window next to the Jwalian mare's stall, watching him talk to three traveling women who have asked to spend the night. Anand Pranam, the happiest of salutations. Even with his palms respectfully joined, Zamindar Mulchan makes the ancient greeting sound perverted. Be my guests for the night, ladies. Say to your hunger with my bread. My home is your home. So, Abhar Zamindar, says the tallest of the women. A hundred thank yous. Another woman might have added the common tongue honorific, G, perhaps even delivered the greeting flirtatiously. This woman doesn't, even though she smiles, her deep brown skin glowing in the moonlight. 
The pallu of her simple homespun sari slides down her head, revealing streaks of blue in her midnight hair. Ma once told me it's the sort of blue that can't be covered up with soot, or the oil from a jatamansi plant, or magic, the mark of someone from the seafaring kingdom of Samudra. The sight of it makes Zamindar Mulchan's unctuous smile slip. My father married a woman from Samudra before the Great War, the woman says now. She died when I was a baby. She speaks our language perfectly, her vani smooth, the accent crisp and airy. It holds no trace of the sea. We are headed back from Sur, where one of my daughters had a baby. The Zamindar would do us poor women a big favor by offering us a place in his stable for the night. The Zamindar turns his attention to the other sari-clad figures. One has shielded herself from his gaze, tucking her pallu like a whale over her mouth and nose. The other, a pretty, pale-skinned young woman, looks unperturbed by his leer. Why don't I offer you and your friends more comfort, he says. I have five guests' bedrooms. It can get lonely in this big old house. We prefer the stable. A hint of steel cuts through the quiet deference in the older woman's voice. Our horses are tired. We need to ensure they're well-rested. She stares at the zamindar until he averts his head and nods. I duck behind a bale of hay in Agni's stall as Mulchan opens the door to the stable, letting in the women. What a lech, a voice says. It's the wailed woman, no, a girl, who finally uncovers her face, revealing dark, surma-lined eyes and skin like fine copper. Like her companions, the girl's black hair is bound in a braided bun. Unlike the other two, she wears a square amulet tied around her upper arm, marking her as a follower of the Prophet Zal. She appears to be a few years older than me. I thought I'd have to strip him naked and hang him upside down from the roof of his stupid haveli. The pale girl snorts. Like what you did to that safflower merchant last year for calling you his little flower bouquet? Seriously, Amira. Don't give me that look, Kali. You were a few seconds away from slicing that zamindar up like an onion with your daggers. A pause before they both burst into giggles. Enough, you two, the older woman cuts in. I don't want to have to modify the memories of an entire household again. Sky warriors were at this village a few days ago. I still see traces of their magic against the trees outside. I think of the stories I heard growing up, of women with shadowy faces and daggers glinting in their hands, women who wear their saris like fisherfolk, who knock down their doors and slash into enemies with knives and swords and spells, the sisterhood of the Golden Lotus. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tanaz. And AJ, that brings us to your reading. If you'd like to also introduce your work and uh, give us a short, short introduction to it. Yes, thank you so much, Carrie. I almost forgot to unmute myself. So I'll be reading from my debut novel, The Hollow Gods, uh, which is a contemporary dark fantasy uh, with some horror undertones. Um, so the book takes place in this small uh, BC town um, where there's a peculiar folklore about a figure known as the Dreamwalker who kidnaps young women um, and takes possession of them. Um, so the book follows uh, one particular um, girl called Mia who suspects that she might be the next victim. So this particular scene takes place after she has a disturbing dream um, where she finally starts to think, oh, I might be next. Um, Okay, so. Gasping for air, Mia's eyes shot open, wet strands of hair clinging to her face and neck as she tried to remember where she was. The windowless gray walls and the sight of her beloved red panda on the wobbly dresser dizzied her with relief as she finally recognized her own bedroom. Taking a deep breath, Mia flopped back against the pillow and exhaled, pulling her hair from her hot, irritated skin. She'd always had pretty wild dreams, but nothing like that before, and never about the fable of Black Hollow. She thought about her earlier resolution to hunt the Dreamwalker and the shadowy woman who'd visited her bedroom with a message. The tables had turned. The Dreamwalker had come to her. No, she was coming for her. Mia's pulse thundered in her ears, the after images of the place she'd returned from fresh like a wet painting. Squeezing her eyes shut, she tried to preserve the impressions, willing herself to record every minute detail. But the dream slipped away like vapor. The paint bled off the canvas, leaving her with nothing but the residue of disquiet. Yet the dream wasn't the only thing that disappeared. The fable too was gone, as though it had been wiped from her psyche. But how could that be? She'd heard the legends a thousand times. Mia strained to remember the lore she'd been taught by the school librarian, 
the warnings her father lectured her with in high school, but it had all vanished. She only knew there was a dreamwalker that spirited young women away. The details, however, were a fast fading ripple in an ocean of memories. She checked the time on her cell phone and realized it was evening. She'd been out for over 12 hours and yet still felt exhausted. Usually after a long bout of insomnia, she'd collapse into a day long coma that left her drowsy and lethargic. But this was different, like she'd gone somewhere during the night. Mia's head rattled like a battered punching bag. Disgruntled, she sat up and threw the covers off, rubbing her eyes until she regained the coordination to stand. Something was wrong. Her skin crawled and her eyes watered. The hairs on her neck stood on end. She kept glancing over her shoulder as though someone was following her, hugging the shadows in every corner. The compulsion to check burned the peripheries of her awareness until there was nothing but an urge to flee. Every cell in her body screamed. Wild, Mia grabbed her keys and ran out of the apartment. Out the door and into the darkness, she didn't dare look back, sprinting until sound fell into a vacuum and silence enveloped her. She didn't stop until she could barely see buildings flickering past her, until traffic lights grew sparse, sidewalks disappeared, and the road narrowed into a single lane of cracked pavement. She moved fast towards the black mass in the horizon, the forest. But before she reached the fields, Mia's chest caved in and she collapsed into a squat, heaving in an effort to catch her breath. She had nothing with her, no wallet, no jacket, no cell phone. She reached the crooked maple some 15 minutes later. As she approached the meadow, the air grew thick and misty. It was quite something, how different the fields looked at night. Without the stalls and vendors embellishing every inch of open space during the market hours, Mia felt like she was passing through a different world. Everything felt more expansive, disorienting, and precarious. By day, it was a space of congregation and community for the people of Black Hollow. By night, it had a life of its own without the presence of humans, one that didn't want to belong to them. It made me a wonder if she would be accepted. That's it. Wonderful, thank you so much, AJ. Um, all right, thank you all for sharing your works. A wonderful way to start the day for me over here on a Sunday. Um, now, I'd love to start digging into questions. Um, first, I am gonna just for our audience clarify that uh, while we're talking about world building today, that you have so many different genres and so many different um, writing styles. And we're, we're talking about a very broad form of world building here, not your typical specific secondary world, fantasy world world building. So I just wanted to make it clear to the audience that when I use the word world building, it'll be about creating spaces and environments and contexts and storytelling, and not necessarily just how do we craft a new language or how do we decide what shops are in <laughs> which city. Uh, to know, I know that I, I'll throw to you for those though, for sure. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so getting started, I wanted to start pretty broad, just kind of get a sense of, you know, what the topic of the panel means to you today as panelists. So I'd love to hear what to you did it mean to think about narrative like as you write. What does it mean to think about crafting these spaces and approaching uh, your environments as a part of your story? So let's start um, with Tanaz if you'd like. <laughs> oh, you're muted, just uh, as a heads up. We'll take turns. Each of us will have one of it. OK, I'm unmuted now. OK, perfect. Uh, so uh, when I think of the idea of narrative geographic, I usually think of the setting because uh, as someone who has lived in three different parts of the world, South Asia, the Middle East, and North America, uh, I feel like setting has always influenced me in some way in terms of uh, you know uh, the history and the politics of the country. And this plays a role into how, when I write, how my characters think, especially in terms of the decisions they make. And I feel that is hugely important in how our settings shape us as people. And then simultaneously, how settings shapes our characters in the book or in the story or how they act and how their motivations change. So that's how I like to think of narrative geography, even though if even if it's contemporary or if it's fantasy. Wonderful. Um, I will throw to AJ next. Sure. Um, so interestingly, I actually think that I almost um, think of narrative geographic in 
uh, a sort of reverse order where when I think of space, um, I tend to think less about the setting and more about the people that make the setting. Um, and that might um, have to do with my own uh, sort of background. And um, so I've spent most of my life in, in Canada, um, but uh, ethnically I'm from elsewhere. I am, you know, diaspora from former Yugoslavia. And so um, in a way like people occupying spaces and telling stories about those spaces um, has been a huge part of how I've understood creating narrative about um, geography. And I think that kind of comes through in, in my work as well, where I world build with people first and then kind of fill in the setting later. So that's kind of how I, I function, I guess. Yeah, I love that. And Sylvia. Um, yeah, I, I realized after I was picked for this panel that I'm probably not suitable for it. I have no idea what narrative geographic means <laughs> at all. So um, if, if this is a term that that is thrown around normally, forgive me, I, yeah, I've, I've got no idea. For me, I just write about the places that I'm interested in. That tends to be different parts of Mexico in different time periods. It's what I'm moved to write. And I've also never liked the term world, world building, so definitely probably not good for this panel. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, I think we have a note from Maya here that narrative geographic was just the term that they used to brand the panel. Um, I think that it's more just about how do places, how do people, how do environments uh, inform the way that you create the stories that you're telling, um, if, that, if that is helpful. Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, also from the panel description, because I, I do love to kind of just start off by grounding everyone in um, what, what, what has been described for us to discuss, but what speaks to weaving home into fantastic backdrops? Um, and I'm curious that like when you're, you know, whether you're thinking about home, whether you're thinking about an environment that you're creating, whether you're thinking about the communities that you're creating and that you're speaking to, um, how, you know, what draws you to working with the speculative and fantastic fiction? And is it a backdrop to you or is it something else? And I'll wait and see, I'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds, I guess, to, uh, <laughs> minutes if we had the time um, to uh, think through, but is there anyone who's eager to jump in on this one? I'll uh, give you a couple of seconds and then... Uh, uh, I'll go, no problem. Wonderful. <laughs> So uh, basically, for me, um, I love the idea of uh, weaving home or the sense of home into a fantasy world. And um, growing up, I used to love reading fantasy. I devour stories about werewolves and witches and vampires. R.L. Stein was a favorite of mine. Uh, I loved his horror. And um, I loved the escape that fantasy allowed me. But I was also drawn to how uh, it allowed me to imagine how a world could be and also highlighted the flaws within our world. And I was especially thinking about this when I was writing my latest book, Hunted by the Sky, which basically uses a setting inspired by medieval India. Now, uh, I was never in medieval India, so that required quite a bit of research. But um, the one thing that was important to me when I was researching was that India is was, is coloni was colonized by the British. And even today, history is told from that lens of colonization. So while writing this book, I had to decolonize my imagination to figure out how my fantasy kingdom of Umber in the book would be both similar to and different from a typical kingdom in 15th or 16th century Hindustan. So in one way, I had to redefine how home would be. And that's kind of what we're always struggling with, I think, as writers, that this is how home is. It has its flaws. It has its beauty as well. So I think that's something that we're always uh, striving to balance in our fiction. Very cool. Yes. And such an, like, such an interesting part of writing within speculative is, and especially the work that you're doing where you're bringing together that very historical and very researched and very, you know, precise form of storytelling while also creating those rooms to be like, how can I shift this? How can I make it more for me? Um, and I really, really love that. I love thinking about allegory and an analogy when you're, and how you can make it your own rather than 
Yes. Um, okay. Uh, AJ, would you uh, like to take mm -hmm. us in there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, I, uh, when I, you know, the, I really latched onto this idea of the fantastic as a backdrop and um, because I was like, no, <laughs> um, for me, the fantastic definitely uh, isn't a backdrop. Um, I think because I actually quite struggle to write very explicitly about um, themes or issues um, that I want to incorporate in my work. And I've always found the fantastic to be an excellent way or an excellent tool to actually explore um, real world issues. Um, and so for me, the fantastic tends to be something that I weave into um, the very fabric of, of the characters' experiences and their lives. So, I mean, I guess it's almost like a, a metaphor, a big metaphor for things that are um, very explicitly experienced, but I kind of like to do it more implicitly through the fantastic, um, if that makes any sense. Um, and I guess one of the key tensions in, um, in I think everything I write is sort of um, this conflict between, I guess, like scientific rationalism and things that are coded as supernatural or fantastic and kind of um, trying to reconcile them without making them mutually exclusive, if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'd love to hear like just a little bit more about that. I'm curious. <laughs> oh, which <laughs> part? Um, yeah, yeah. Last bit about bringing those two things together. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think that um, like we tend to think about, you know, like science or rationality as being like a, a binary opposite of um, fantastic or supernatural or folklore, which is sort of a source of a lot of the fantastic. Um, and, you know, what I find um, is that oftentimes these things are kind of, kind of, they mutually constitute each other. Like you sort of need this like idea of, of the irrational or the fantastic to create this idea of the rational and the scientific. And so I think by really playing on that tension in fiction, um, we can show that it's not necessarily that rationality or science trumps all these other kinds of systems of knowledge, but rather that, um, they kind of exist in the same world and they're part of the same world and they're all narratives, right? So like science for me is a narrative the same way that, um, you know, folklore is a narrative. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that. Yeah, I actually, I'm very excited about this because uh, my big, two of my big nerdy interests are history of science and also um, folklore and fairy tales. So I got a little excited there. <laughs> um, and then Sylvia, I know that you've been in the speculative space for so long. Um, I would love to hear from you on this um, to just readdress the, the question because I know it's been a little while. Um, it was that Watts speaks to weaving home into fantastic backdrops. And I was asking whether home is uh, a part of the story or whether it's just working with the speculative, you know, what draws you to, to this space? I think it was in the 1970s that Gabriel Garcia Marquez said that he wrote the way he wrote because in Mexico, surrealism runs through the streets. And it's a sentiment that I have always shared. There is something um, fantastic and insane in growing up in Mexico and things that don't seem to be in the realm of reality that are. so. For example, in Mexican Gothic, I have this town, which is uh, a British town in the middle of central Mexico. And some person who doesn't know much about Mexico hearing about that might think, well, that's hooky. That's just silly and stupid to have a British town in the middle of Mexico. Um, who would do that? And the answer is the British would do it in the 19th century and the 1800s when they established a real town called Real del Monte. Well, they established themselves in a town called Real del Monte. And, um, and they started mining silver in the area and their presence meant that this town was known as a nickname Little Cornwall and it has an English cemetery. So I did not make any of that up. It's just something that is true and happened and you can go visit Real del Monte anytime you want and you can get on an airplane. Um, but it's, it's the sort of thing where if you if you told somebody about a setup, or, oh, there's like this little British imitation town 
in the middle of Mexico, somebody would say, oh, well, that's mighty convenient for a gothic novel. Well, you know, it's reality. Um, and there's bits like that that intrude and protrude into reality. I was also talking to my friend, Levi Tidar, who's writing a, a crime novel, and uh, he's from Israel, and he was uh, originally, and he was telling me, well, there, he thought he was going to have to make up some bits of his crime novel and he discovered that he doesn't have to it's already so outrageous that there is no need to invent almost anything it's the same thing with mexico when i'm writing when i'm thinking about crime thrillers or doing research there's no need to really invent much of anything there's already a lot of reality that seems in the realm of the unreal and so that's just what i draw upon to write mm. So I'm just finishing taking some notes. Um, wonderful, thank you. Yeah, such a, so very much concerned with like that liminality then, is that? I think the separation that occurs between realism and unrealism that normally happens in modern, um, I guess, American media or Anglo media and the separation between genres where you do not want um, your horror fiction touching your romance or your romance touching your crime fiction is for me odd and bizarre having grown up in a space where those categories are not clear cut because we don't have genre fiction. And on, one, on the one hand side, that is kind of sad and bad because there is no like Mexican romance as a genre. There is no science fiction and fantasy uh, in Mexico as a local genre, you buy the foreign stuff, uh, but locally produced stuff, we don't, we, everything kind of goes into the, you know, local literature pile uh, section, just, you know, um, it's, it's a lot less genreified and categorized. And on the one hand that can be bad because then you don't develop certain subcategories, but can also be good because then you don't you're not afraid of the peas touching the mashed potatoes like most um, <laughs> other you know like anglo culture is where you're not supposed to get out of this tiny concentric circle and so in in anglo literature if you suddenly have something like oh there, there's ghosts in in a book then people will naturally say well it's a horror novel well you know not if you're in latin america um then what is it you know is it is it a young adult novel? Is it, you know, then you get into these spaces where, um, yeah, there's no capacity for things to be liminal. And, and that is the space that I grew up with in a way. And so I cannot fathom existing in just, you know, one single category and eliminating everything in order to fit to that. So for example, saying, well, um, this is a serious, uh, you know, this is serious literature, so we're taking out the ghosts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, okay, of course, wonderful. Yeah, I love, thank you for that. That was, that was fantastic. Um, I am gonna move us into, I think, our last official question. We have a couple of questions from the audience that I'd like to get to, so um, I might move us a little bit along on this question, um, maybe like two minute responses so we can get to audience questions before we wrap up. This has gone so quickly. Um, I'm having too much fun. Uh, so I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, what is the work that goes into creating your stories, your communities, your worlds, your um, spaces, whether, you know, that is the people, AJ, or if it's actual environments, or if it's the histories, um, all of it goes in. So world building, what I said, can mean a lot of things. It's complex, nuanced practice. So when you're crafting your worlds, whether it's our timeline or secondary worlds, um, for our audience, secondary worlds is like your fantasy worlds that take place in spaces that are not our world um, or just fictional worlds. You know, it's just what do you pay attention to when you're when you're creating your stories? And if you'd like to touch on it, which we already have, how your lived experience um, influences the way that you shape those worlds. And you can speak to whatever whatever jumps out to you or whatever interests you when you're when you're building. This is supposed to be about you. I don't have a specific answer in mind. Tanaz, yeah? 
Uh, well, I uh, typically I start off with a character in a scene and uh, usually it's something crazy is happening to them and that's how my stories begin. And then most of the time I have a setting in place usually and the setting for me always gives life to the story. I remember when I was working on an earlier version of uh, Hunted by the Sky, I had written it as a science fiction dystopia and I had set it in a completely different world and it was very skeletal, it was not working. And then I thought to myself, why don't I change things around and make this uh, you know in a place that's inspired by India or more specifically medieval India which was a historical period that I was obsessed with as a teenager and uh, no one not many people had written about it even in a fantasy setting there were only a couple of writers who were playing with it so I said let's start playing and I think it's that idea of just playing and having fun with your setting that starts the world, you know, the world built itself in a way. And so that's what I am thinking about. So I'm not a very intentional writer, I'm trying to be. But for the most part, I'm just there and I'm just having fun with it. So that's how I world built. Wonderful. And I know that you were also interested in speaking, like, I know that I said that we'd go quick, but I, I'm curious, I want to throw you your second question. Um, I know that you were interested in speaking to the historical research that goes in to in the inspiration sourcing there. So I was thinking this might be a good place to do a very, very light, I probably not full <laughs> engagement, but I just wanted to throw that to you as well. Okay, sure. Um, so in terms of the research that I went into, I definitely wanted to do research because it's a real historical period that is inspiring fantasy. So I uh, read up on primary historical sources like Ayn Akbari by Abul Fazl Mubarak, who was a courtier at Emperor Akbar's palace, and he had written this whole treatise about administration during the Mughal period. I also read a lot of historical nonfiction, especially by women writers and women historians like Ruby Lal, because you know medieval India was a fascinating place rich with culture, but the recorded history is very male-centric and often told by male historians. So I needed a female perspective to really shed light on the stories of these amazing women who were warriors and they defended fortresses against enemies uh, and invading, uh, invading armies and stuff like that. But their stories are really footnotes in history. So for me, uh, that was really important. And especially in terms of the of women that I represent in the book. And I thought, you know, okay, so they'll be ready to fight and take up arms and also have magic. And that was the really cool part about bringing fantasy into this historical setting. Oh my goodness, that sounds so wonderful. I am so excited. Um, but I will I will uh, take us over maybe to Sylvia, switch up our order a little bit. Hey there. Um, yeah, I, I always find difficult the term world building because nobody asks uh, kind of, I guess, dramatic literary writers how they world, world build. You don't generally go into conversations about how does Scott Fitzgerald world build the great Gatsby, even though it is not probably, uh, well, it is not an accurate representation of life in the 1920s. Jay Gatsby is living a fantasy life in a, in a gigantic mm -hmm. palace. Um, so I think the emphasis on, on world building often becomes in, in a lot of um, Anglo books and Anglo media, a uh, Dungeons and Dragons sort of situation where you're expected to outline, um, know everything about the world that there is um, and mm -hmm. uh, every single spell and every single creature that lives in the dungeon and go on length about it as, as a writer. And I always am a bit baffled by that because I don't know how my microwave works. I don't know if anybody <laughs> really here could explain to me exactly how the microwave works. I know that I put a bag of popcorn and it comes out as something that I can eat, but I have not really understood its circuitry very um, uh, with, with a lot of care. And yet that is sometimes the level of discourse that we have and some of this world building is, well, you need to know how the microwave works of, of the equivalent uh, um, sort of situation. And, and you get into all this technical detail and, and on often they think other things are, are forgotten, which are more important to me. And, and that stuff like what kind of street food is there or is there any kind of street food or is it forbidden? Um, in in a city or something like that, and that doesn't seem to be so important. So you get all these, um, um, yeah, kind of technical details and long detailed desire for things, while other things are completely forgotten. 
and the world when we see it we don't see all of it we don't know all of it so in a way world building is a is a sort of fallacy i always consider mm -hmm. it to be like a theater like a theater play when you go to the theater you see some scenery some backdrops and you sit down and you're willing to believe that if you're watching Shakespeare's The Tempest, that that is an island, even though there's just fuzzy, you know, like maybe maybe palm trees drawn in the background. You're not really on an island. And so I think that good literature is like that. It just invites you to believe. And you don't have to know every blade of grass in, in a world just because it's imaginary or even if even if it's real, to make it believable because in The Tempest you go and you sit down and you have a good time for a couple of hours and you don't really get on a boat, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that the kind of gesture towards the world built by the constructs that you do have in place or the, the story and characters that you do have in place. Um, AJ, I think I will throw to you. And then uh, we have one question that I will see if anyone would like to take towards our, our last, very last couple of minutes. Sure. Um, so first of all, I, I want to say that I loved Sylvia's comment and I actually find it very relatable um, because yeah, I do, I actually really struggle with the notion of world building as like a set of boxes that you have to tick and, and sort of there has to be this systemic um, thing that must make sense, like, it, it, you know, internally, it must make sense. And I think that um, this sort of obsession that we get in Western literature, where things have to make sense in a fantastical setting is, um, it really takes away from from actually uh, meeting the work on its own terms. Um, so that's just something I wanted to kind of throw out um, to add on to Sylvia's comment. Um, and for me, you know, when I quote, unquote, world build, um, again, it is very much about the people in the world um, and the stories that they tell about themselves, because I think that the stories we tell about ourselves really kind of construct our world. Um, <clears throat> so rather than seeing the world as this kind of objective thing that exists outside of people, I think it's created by people and there is no one world, so to speak. And so that's part of my um, why I also kind of feel that the idea of a systemic world especially a fantasy world that has to make perfect sense um, and that has to have, you know, all the rules kind of laid out is um, maybe not the most productive way to approach literature. Mm -hmm. I do love the idea of that, of that multiplicity of worlds um, created by the people that occupy it. That's, uh, yeah, I, I very much enjoy that. Um, Okay, I'm going to throw us to our one question here, uh, which is, how do you balance who has systemic versus supernatural power in your stories? And I'm not sure if supernatural is uh, the most useful or most applicable term, but I'll, I'll allow you to kind of uh, apply that to your works as, as you think is most useful. Uh. If I can just, so the way that I'm understanding this is systemic would mean that the power or, or whatever it is, is kind of, endemic to the world itself, whereas supernatural would be someone who is able to do things that are like external to the laws of the world, I guess. Is that? Yeah, I think I don't it, know if that's kind of. I think it's uh, community based power or, you know, structural power that we would see in our world versus um, magical or supernatural power that exists within the within the worlds that you're you're writing, but not necessarily ours. Hmm. <laughs> it's a big question for the final three minutes, I know. <laughs> I think whatever, whoever has power um, in this world, uh, I think the main point of writing that sort of um, uh, system into the book is really about who, how does it create conflict? Because whenever I'm writing a book, I'm always thinking about how does, uh, you know, who, how do the people who have power 
have a conflict with those who don't. And especially this was true for Hunted by the Sky, where the um, magic wielding majority are oppressing the non magic wielding minority. So I was kind of uh, using that as an allegory to refer to the caste system in India. And that's something that uh, was really important in the way I expressed and I built this world. So I, um, I think so reality really um, feeds into my fantasy a lot, especially when I'm writing. And I think in terms of how does this sort of power create conflict? And for, uh, in many cases, like in India, for example, religion can be a huge aspect of creating conflict in the subcontinent. However, in this particular world, magic was a source of conflict. So whatever uh, creates conflict is always it's always related to power so I think it has to be intrinsically related to that wonderful um, we have a minute left if anyone else would like to jump in and add their thoughts but otherwise I can take us down that's a weird way to put that sorry <laughs> um, I'll just add a very quick comment about power um, I, was, I was thinking about you know I was tripping up on systemic power. Uh, you know, I often think of critiques and, uh, you know, discourse, you know, discourse with a capital D. Um, but I think in uh, fictional worlds, a lot of the time, um, power can also feel very diffuse. I mean, it, it is diffuse in real life too. Like everyone can kind of contribute to systemic problems um, and systemic power in ways they don't even recognize. Um, so I think um, sometimes the way that systemic power is actually very diffuse and reinforced by everyone in a community can almost feel supernatural sometimes. And that's just something that I kind of thought of um, regarding my per my work personally. So, but that's it. I'm, I'm not going to take up more time. No, that's great. I just got a note from Maya saying that we have uh, a little more time. So Sylvia, I saw that you unmuted. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. If you, uh, if that was the intent of the unmute. I was just unmuting to be ready to say bye. So okay. <laughs> I were working at the timer. So yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Um, then I will wrap us up. That is a better <laughs> way to put that. Um, and yeah, I would love to invite all of you to, to say a quick bye to our audience. Um, thank you on my behalf for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, having us. Yeah, thanks for having thanks, me. Thanks, everyone. This is fun. Thank you. Maya, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're all doing it this morning. It's Sunday morning. Good morning. Um, thank you all for <laughs> joining us. It was a pleasure to listen to you all this morning. Um, our panelist books are Me Mexican Gothic, Hunted by the Sky, and The Hollow Gods. And all of these titles are available from Back of Phoenix Books at backofphoenixbooks.com. Uh, so thanks again to our panelists. Um, we will be back at 11.15 for, for When the Author is a Character with Joe Walton and Randall Graham in conversation with Avi Silver. So we'll see you back then.
Hello, and welcome back to Ideas and Imagination. We are ready to get started with our next panel, which is When the Author is a Character. Um, and I'm here to introduce your next moderator, Avi Silver. Avi is a queer, non-binary author and editor of speculative fiction. They co-created The Shale Project, an award-winning indie arts collective, and are passionate about stories that wield tenderness as a tool of change. They are also an assistant editor with Augur Magazine. Two Dark Moons is their first novel. Welcome, Avi. It's really good to have you here this morning. Thank you so much, Maya. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm so excited. <laughs> so are we. Wonderful. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Today, we are going to tune in to hear masters of their craft discuss breaking the fourth wall in books. What happens when the author of a story starts interacting with their characters on the page? So now, let's please welcome Joe Walton. So Joe Walton is a multiple award winning author, including the World Fantasy Award for Tooth and Claw and the Hugo and Nebula Awards for among others. In addition to writing science fiction and fantasy, she also designs role playing games and has published poetry. A native of Wales, she lives in Montreal. Hi, Joe. Hi. Great to be here. Oh, so good to have you. And I'm also so excited to introduce Randall Graham. So Randall Graham is a law professor at Western University, where his teaching and research focus on ethics and legal language. His first novel, Before Life, won the Ippy Gold Medal for Fantasy Fiction and was a top 10 finalist for the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor. He lives in London, Ontario. Welcome, Randall. Thanks very much. It's lovely to be here. So great to have you. So before we get started, I just have a couple general announcements. Um, you're going to be hearing about some great books today. So when you're trying to shop about them, feel free to shop the book list with Baca Phoenix Books. Visit BacaPhoenixBooks.com or find the link in the live YouTube comments scroll. And don't forget to check out the beautiful digital marketplace. Access it through the Watts Toronto website or at the link dropped in the YouTube live comment scroll. So I'm so excited to be having this conversation. I'm just going to keep saying how excited I am. So just get ready for that. Um, but before we start off, I would love to hear uh, readings from both of you. Um, Joe, would you like to begin? Sure. Wonderful. So uh, I'm going to be reading from uh, my new novel, uh, Or What You Will, which just came out in July, uh, which is my Breaking the Fourth Wall book. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to read the first two pages without any explanation you can cope. So, chapter one, The Bone Cave. She won't let me tell all the stories. She says it'll make them all sound the same. She's had too much of my tricks and artfulness, she says. I have been inspiration, but now she is done with me. So I am trapped inside this cave of bone, this hollow of skull, this narrow and limited point of view that is all I am allowed, like a single shaft from a dark lantern. She has all the power, but sometimes she needs me. Sometimes I get out. I have been is a very Celtic way to begin a self-introduction. I have been a Celt. It's as if the best way to present yourself is with an interlocking set of riddles, a negotiation of images and history and shared knowledge, creating a relationship between us, where, instead of information being imparted from me to you, you are instead asked to invoke your own wisdom and cunning at information stores, to involve yourself in a guess. I have been, in those long Celtic poems, often gives way to I am, more riddles, often boasting, phrased as sets of opposite qualities. I have been too many things to count. I have been a dragon with a boy on his back. I have been a scholar, a warrior, a lover and a thief. I have been dream and dreamer. I have been a god. I have stood by the wind-racked orchard near the storm coast. I have been guardian of the good water. I am wise, but sometimes reckless. I am famed for my fast answers, but I would never proclaim that I am witty. You see, I am not modest. The sun, my brother, will never catch me napping, nor the lazy sunbeam warm my pillow. I am friend to monsters, companion to bees. I have been a storm bringer and a storm tamer. My silver tongue runs up and down, on and back. Oh, yes, I have been a poet. 
My prison now is the skull of a poet. I am deathless, but I have spent time on death's many paths. Yes, time can be currency, especially now that I have so much of it, I can be profligate. I have been a boy with a book, burning, burning. I've been a shepherd and a fierce bearded goat looking down from a high path. What am I? What am I? Figment, fakement, fragment, furious, fancy-free form. I have been the spark that ignites in a cold winter. I have been the swell of a warm penis in the darkness. I have been laughter at daybreak and tears before bedtime. I have been a quick back answer. I have been too clever for my own good, especially that last. I have been a character and I have been a narrator, but now I don't know what I am. She doesn't want to let me out again, that's the problem. I think she may be afraid, but she doesn't say that. She says she's used me too much and wants to change. When I say I can change, that I can be whatever she wants, I have been the roar of a lion, I have been a weaver and torn cobweb blowing in the wind, and moonbeams enlightening a chink in a wall and summer fields full of sprouting mustard seed. Then, she says, she needs to make up the world first. Imagine that power to make worlds. I can make and shape and take no worlds. I slide myself into the worlds I am given and find myself, frame myself, tame myself into the space there where I can see to be me. I sliver like quicksilver, fast flowing to fill up the form. But now she says she doesn't want me to. So I don't know what to do. I'm lonely. I miss you. That's it. Thank you so much. What an opening. <laughs> Wonderful. And then Randall, would you like to give us your reading as well? Sure thing. Thanks very much. Um, my reading requires about 50 seconds of context beforehand, if it hopes to make any sense at all. Um, the tagline for my latest book, Afterlife Crisis, is it's okay if you don't believe in the afterlife. The people who live there don't believe in you either. Um, and Afterlife Crisis is my second book set in a version of the afterlife where no one believes in the mortal world. Everyone in this afterlife has forgotten their pre-mortem lives and they think that anyone who claims to remember living a mortal life is suffering from a mental disorder called the before life delusion. Uh, part of the fun of the series is that I get to populate the afterlife with dead historical figures who retain their basic character traits, aptitudes, and preferences, but who forget their mortal lives and refuse to believe they've lived them. The narrator of this latest book, Rinnick Feynman, uh, has been a patient in those afterlife mental institutions uh, alongside people with the before life delusion. Like those patients, it's unclear in the book whether Rinnick requires treatment or if he actually has extra insight into the world around him. And that's because Rinnick believes that he's a character in a novel about the afterlife. Rinnick worships the author of that novel and sees it as his duty to carry out the author's will by writing the first draft. Uh, so Rinnick is either delusional or the most insightful character in my little world. And I'm either playing with narrative structure or engaging in a particularly narcissistic writing exercise. And I will let you be the judge of that. So with that, uh, here goes just the first page and a half. Zeus, I said, once the dust had settled, the chickens had hatched and the chips had fallen where they may. I don't mind telling you that while we were still in the thick of it and before the happy endings were strewn about with a lavish hand, there were moments when I felt things mightn't end so frightfully well. One might even say that Rennick Feynman, though no weakling, came within a whisk whisker of despair. No kidding, said the honest fellow. I mean, one couldn't say that peril didn't loom. It loomed like the Dickens. The tortured Napoleons, the corrupted ancients, the bone-chilling brushes with matrimony, not to mention the even greater threat of, but wait, I've gone off the rails. Eager to bring my public up to speed on current events, I've shot off the mark like a scalded cat and left the readership befogged. It's a snag I often come up against when starting a story, viz, the dash difficult business of where to begin. No doubt you've found yourself in the same sand trap. I mean, if you bung in too much explanatory chit chat at the starting gate, establishing what is known as atmosphere, or sorting out who begat whom all the way back to the primordial soup, you fail to grip. You see your readers, if any, stifling yawns and reshelving the book before you can say what ho. Yet if you string off, spring off the bat at a couple of hundred MPH, without supplying the merest whiff of expositional whatnots, you leave your public at a loss and yelling for footnotes. 
And it now occurs to me that in opening the tale of present interest with the above slice of dialogue, I've made the second of these two floaters, failing altogether to set the stage for the super sticky affair involving Zeus, Isaac Newton, Nappy, Vera Lance, Dr. Everard M. Pyrrhix, and the Napoleon who had lately taken to calling himself Jack, a tale which my biographers will probably call Rinnick and the Newtonian Horror, or possibly Feynman Conquers Science. But by whatever name the affair is called, after taking all in all and weighing this against that, I suppose that it's best to begin the story at the inception of my quest, if inceptions are the things I'm thinking of, and describe events in a roughly chronological order, allowing readers to string along and draw such character strengthening lessons as they might from their perusal of my adventures. And so we begin, as it were, at the beginning. Let me marshal my facts, weigh anchor, and shove off. Randall, thank you so much. Two great beginnings. I'm so excited. <laughs> See, there it is. We'll do the I'm so excited count. So let's talk about these incredible books. Um, you know, the title of this panel is When the Author is a Character. And I think that's so interesting <laughs> because when the author is a character, what then is the character? Um, which creates a whole sort of tumultuous experience of existential questions. And each of your books, I would say, tackles um, some of these existential questions pretty clearly. So I'd love to learn about, you know, how, how the existential elements of your work are approached in the text and what the impact of writing that was like during your process. Whoever wants to jump in, feel free. <laughs> All right, I'll uh, I'll jump in on that one. I uh, like to play with the, the question of what is real and what isn't uh, throughout the book. Uh, for example, with the Rinnick Feynman character who who worships the author, we're we're unclear throughout the book whether, for the purposes of the universe in which he finds himself, whether Rinnick is actually correct because we we do know that he is a character in a novel, but in in the universe in which he exists, is he supposed to be a character in a novel, or is he simply delusional and and trying to uh, to to work out some particular issue? Um, similarly, we we don't know if that cosmic author who Rinnick worships is is that supposed to be me? Is that supposed to actually be a, an author? Is it Rinnick himself? Um, I don't want to give too many spoilers away when we figure out who Rinnick actually is by the end of the book, but uh, um, I try to work my way through those sorts of uh, existential questions uh, about what counts as real, what counts as delusion. Uh, most of the characters in uh, in the book have forgotten their pre-mortem lives. And, and the question throughout the book is, are, are they delusional in fact? Are, are they suffering from poor life delusions? Are they actually remembering snippets of a real life that they had? Or are these people in fact people who just need treatment at the at the hands of the people in, in Detroit Mercy Hospice where much of the action is set? And uh, I try to cope with that by, by never quite resolving the, the, the question of what counts as real and what counts as fiction throughout the book. Um, the, that, that's the way I've approached it. And uh, I, I never really do resolve those, those questions for people. I like to leave those things up in the air because I think that's a much more interesting way to approach fiction, for me anyway. So I think uh, when, when you're thinking about the, the meta level of things like this, where you've got an author who is a character, which which I do. I have a character who's a character whose voice we just heard, and uh, he has an author, and he has conversations with her, and she is a character in the book, and she is not me. She is very definitely not me. She is she is a character. But usually, when people are doing this, they're either doing it as comedy for for humour, or if they're doing it seriously then it tends to be very kind of distanced and cold and ironic in the, the sort of fourth wall breaking way. And I read, uh, a few years ago, I read uh, Diderot's uh, Jacques Le Fataliste. Uh, and Diderot does this fourth wall breaking in a very warm, open, friendly, positive way. And I thought that is something really different. I haven't seen that before. And there's a, there's a spot in uh, Jacques Le Fetiliste where Diderot says, okay, the, the character's are very tired and they've gone to bed. And while they're sleeping, I will tell you this story. And he starts to tell you a story. And then he says, actually, I'm really tired. I'm going to get in bed in between the two characters and have a nap now. And uh, you can rejoin me in the morning. And I loved that. I just 
absolutely love that. My, I wanted to do something that was uh, playing with those sorts of levels of uh, where where are we in layers of of reality, but also that was that was warm uh, and and not cold. Absolutely. I think um, that's really fascinating. I think about the intimacy of the relationship that um, authors often have with characters. You know, there's there's an extreme power dynamic there when you know you're, you're the one building the world and they're the one within it. So um, I'd love, to, I, I almost hate to ask this question because it's the topic of much, much discourse. But in your own writing experiences, who's flying the plane for you? There's sort of these two streams of thought that I tend to see, one of which is I write them, I tell them what they do that makes a story happen and one where people go, the characters tell me what the story is. What do you each find tends to be your personal experience if you don't mind sharing? And since Randall started, I can pass this to you, Joe, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Um, it isn't like either of those things for me. Uh, I, I often think of a character rather than deliberately make them up. The character kind of comes to me either from something real or, or a character in a book that doesn't go the way the character isn't the way that I want the character to be. And I'll sort of think of how it would be more interesting if a character was like something else or there'll be somebody in real life. And somebody in real life will do an inexplicable thing. And I think, why the heck would somebody do that? And I'll make up a justification for why a person would do that thing, which won't be why the real person did the real thing. But then I'll sort of get a character. And then when I when I have characters, uh, they they'll interact with each other and produce the the plot. But it's 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 all me really, and I'm well aware that it's all me really. But I had the I have the idea for this uh, character who is stuck in the author's head and the, the bone cave is bounded in time, she's gonna die. She's 20 years older than me, she's, she's a cancer survivor, she's going to die, he's worried about what's gonna happen to him. And I have this idea when I was on a panel with uh, Jim McDonald, uh, author of the Mage World books, and he said that he has a repertory cast of characters that he casts in his novels. And that they, uh, he's got, he's got the the wise old guy and the perky girl and these kinds of characters, and and I was sort of recoiling a little bit. But he's sort of like when he's when he's doing a new novel, he sort of interviews them for who's going to be who's going to take which part. And I immediately thought, what happens in between? What happens when he's not writing the novel before they come to the interview? What are they doing then? Uh, and, and they sort of, his imaginary characters had reality in my head of waiting around to be given a part. Uh, and, uh, and I got the, the idea of this narrator sort of waiting there to be the narrator, to be the protagonist in her books, but waiting to be given the, the job and not knowing how to be his own self separate from all that. Uh, and and who he was. So that's that's where that came from. It's not that I usually have characters sitting around in my head, drumming their fingers, waiting for me to hire them. Just waiting for the interview. You're going to need some references, your past experiences. Do you have a portfolio we can consult? You know, just exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, Randall. What about you? Uh, the, one of the weirder things about the Before Life series is that it, it started it with no characters at all. I, I didn't plan on having any characters because it started as an academic piece on microeconomics. Um, and uh, in my in my day job, I, I write about law, and I was writing a piece on uh, microeconomic analysis of of lawyers' ethical decision making. And uh, uh, in order to pursue that uh, project, I was uh, writing up a little thought experiment. Uh, trying to demonstrate the concept of scarcity, the notion that you can't have whatever you want whenever you want it because resources are limited um, and you can't necessarily do all the things you want to do with the time, the money, the, the other resources that you have. And so I, uh, for the purposes of this thought experiment, I posited a world that had no scarcity in it where people could have whatever they want whenever they wanted it. And I quickly realized that in order to have no scarcity, uh, time couldn't be scarce either. So I had to eliminate mortality. People had to be able to live forever if they wanted to be able to have whatever they wanted. And then that little thought experiment that I started teasing out sort of ate the book and the, uh, um, the, the 
academic piece I was writing never happened. And I started thinking about the fact that this hypothetical world I was creating looked a lot like Judeo-Christian traditional um, notions of the afterlife. And once I had this hypothetical world that I was building, I, I realized that I could populate it with all of my favorite people uh, who had ever lived in history. And so Isaac Newton came in and Socrates came in and Plato came in and Joan of Arc came in. And uh, um, the characters that I hadn't intended to be there to pursue a particular piece about the notion of scarcity, about the notion of microeconomics, about legal interpretation, uh, suddenly that became staffed with all of these characters. And I, I actually experienced myself um, losing the story to them sometimes because I, I wanted to be somewhat true to how Isaac Newton might behave in an afterlife if he couldn't remember having been Isaac Newton or how Plato might behave in the afterlife if he couldn't remember having been Plato but had the same sort of character traits, the same sort of inclinations that uh, um, he would have had in the mortal world. So I, I really did sometimes feel driven by the characters to, to make the story play out somewhat differently than it would have. The main plot points stayed intact throughout once I had uh, come up with the for this thing but uh, sometimes the the, the character should n did nudge me off the rails a little bit absolutely this is actually a great jumping off point because i um one thing that's really distinct about both of your works i think is the use of you know real events real people historical figures uh places um in, within fiction, I'm primarily a secondary world uh, writer. Maybe I can only do one kind of Google search. I don't know. So I'm really fascinated to hear about how working with um, real historical events and people impacts your views of you know fiction versus reality, where sort of that influence comes in. Uh, Joe, I'm thinking about um, when I was reading or what you will, I was very moved by the section with Amanetto Amanatini, and I was just like the 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 humanization of of this person and Randall reading yours, looking at just so many people who who were there throughout history, and I'd I'd love to know just what your experience was of crossing the real and the fictional, and how that impacted your process. I hope that question's clear. <laughs> So that's a big question. <laughs> so for for a lot of my books, for my first, uh, I think, 10 books, I didn't put any real people in them. They were either secondary world fantasy or they were in the real world, but they were th there were no real people in them, um, no historical people. And I sort of felt like it was better not to because there's an issue of respect and, and the reality of real real people. And then I started writing my, my Thessaly books, which is Time Travelers Recreating or Creating Plato's Republic. And I needed to have real people in those. And I started thinking about all this issue of it. And I was like, well, as long as you are respectful and you've you've read the works of those people so that you can do their voices, you can put them in. And I, I started uh, doing that. Um, and in this book, what I'm really doing with using real people is talking about what we know about history. Because one of the themes of this book is what a renaissance is. And in order to, to talk about what a renaissance is and what it is to be making art and having a renaissance, having a golden age, uh, I, I look at the Italian Renaissance uh, in an in a interesting way. And when you read nonfiction and when you read historical fiction, but particularly when you read nonfiction, you become aware of how much we don't know and how many cracks there are. And the stories happen in those cracks. And I just thought, you know, uh, I'm going to go straight on about what we don't know. And so in that bit you were just mentioning with the with, uh, uh, Amantini, uh, what I'm talking about is the lacunae, the bits in the story that we don't have. Where was his mother? You know, why didn't she have her own key? Who cooks the food? These questions that we do not know and cannot answer. No matter how much historical research we did, we, we will not know where his mother was. We just can't know because nobody recorded that, that fact uh, of, 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 of that. And you can do research about who cooks the food culturally, and it's an interesting thing, but it's left out of most things. And I think that those lacunae, the things that are left out, are just very productive of story. And when you're, when you're using real people and real 
history that interacts in a really interesting way with what you're what you're making up. Absolutely, Randall. Do you have anything to speak on with this? Uh, sure. For me, uh, much of the theme of, of the second book centers on the fact that what we think of as history is is always contingent, always subject to interpretation by whoever it is who has the power to interpret that history. Uh, a lot of my my academic work is uh, uh, something that became um, in, into focus yesterday with the appointment to, or attempted appointment of a new U.S. Supreme Court justice is the whole notion of originalism in the interpretation of legislation. And uh, what I often write about is how judges, when purporting to interpret history, what was the history behind this piece of legislation? What was the historical intent that led to the passing of that legislation? you have significant power to imprint your own ideology on that history. You can spin out a version of history that justifies the choices that you want to make, that justifies um, the, the, the outcomes that you want to generate through your interaction with the text. And so in this particular book, um, I, I've got Rinnick Feynman, who believes that he's subject to the whims of an author, and that author can change history through editorial revision. So Rinnick doesn't mind the fact that, that history might change, that the, that the characters he believes he's interacting with might be Rewritten. He doesn't even know what elements of his own character sketch are stable, what are being rewritten by the author, uh, if his own history is reliable. And he's strangely cool with that. That's the, uh, the, the reason Rennick sort of becomes the hero here, because he's the one person in the whole afterlife who doesn't care if history is stable or not, and he's not expecting history to remain stable. So uh, the, the, the antagonist in the book, Isaac Newton, suddenly has in a very literal way the power to change history to suit his preferences. And uh, so I, I do feel some sense of obligation to be somewhat true to those historical characters who I'm using in the novel. But the fact that history is always subject to revision, history is always subject to interpretation, even within the bounds of the novel, just as they are in, in, in legal interpretation, is sort of the theme of the book. So I, I don't mind departing from their real histories and shaking things up a bit. And I also have the, the safety net of the fact that this is supposed to be a silly little comedy for the most part. And uh, if I don't uh, stick uh, to the, the, the true nature of Isaac Newton, the true nature of Plato, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody cares because uh, um, it's all done in service of, uh, of, of a silly little plot. That's so interesting. I think about, you know, in, in both of these, these books, there's, um, again, I sort of started this asking about the existential questions. And I feel like as human beings alive on this planet right now, managing what we are, there's, there's this back and forth between um, earnestness and humor that sort of used to approach um, these, these larger topics that I, it's very hard to, you know, despite the fact that we're writing the author as a character, I know I personally look around and feel like the character a lot, like looking at the author, like, what's next? Are we, are we still doing this? <laughs> How's this going? So I, I'd like to know a little bit about, um, in this current moment, what space do you think these, these fourth wall breaking stories occupy? Um, how would you like, like this is again, a very, very author question, but how would you like your book to land during this sort of collective moment of seeking answers from the author? When I was writing, uh, or what you will, um, in the summer of 2018 in Florence, uh, it's, it, one of the other themes of this book is death. It's a funny book about death, uh, but it is it is about death and about facing death, and we are all going to die, and um, only yeah. Uh, and one of the things I was thinking is that we don't culturally uh, we're, we're dying later and later. We we're getting really coy about death. It's like we've swapped taboos with Victorians, so that we've got sex front and center, and death is taboo, and we don't talk about it. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, uh, this this book can sort of like examine some of this stuff uh, for people who are very unfamiliar with this. And then, of course, it comes out this July when people are being a lot more familiar with uh, death that is happening all around and the fear of death, uh, much more so uh, in this situation. But how it is being read and received, at least looking at my naive reviews, my, my Goodreads reviews and so on, uh, is people reading it saying, it's so wonderful to read about Florence when I can't go anywhere. 
and people are people are doing that and there's a line in this book where the where the narrator says to the reader sort of directly addressing the reader to tell the reader to go to florence and like giving them restaurant advice and, and things for sort of what you should do when you when you go to florence and when i wrote that i did not mean that to be mean i did not mean that to be something out of reach for the reader uh in any way um and and now it's being read in a in a different way two years after i wrote it uh where it, it isn't there and i sort of uh i, I would like to sort of like ha have added to that and have him say go now you know not the day or the hour because you know <laughs> what yeah. timing Honestly, the additional context that everything that everyone was writing got from the world, you know, globally, suddenly you're like, yeah, got it. Well, the world, <laughs> the book, the book that I was in the middle of writing in March is like so obsolete, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> oh, no. Here's to a time where it will feel less obsolete. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Randall! Do you have anything to say on this? Uh, sure, my my books probably, if if I were to be psychoanalyzed about them, uh, are, are me working through my own death anxiety. Right? Uh, they're they're set in an afterlife, and where no one believes in the mortal world, we get to live forever, and uh, it, it creates this notion that th there will be continuity. Um, there there's not going to be a time when there's no more us, and. I uh, I hope that that lands on people at a time when everyone is is coping with a lot of death and health anxiety. I imagine uh, I hope it lands as light comedy rather than as uh, anything that's going to make them interrogate their own thoughts on mortality because we're all doing enough of that right now. Um, I I do pursue some legal theory projects through my my fiction writing, and I, I don't necessarily care if that's what lands on anybody I, I i'm working that out myself and if people do find those little theoretical snippets hidden in there then then i'm happy for them if if they enjoy them then so much the better but really what i'm hoping particularly in a time like this is that people who who end up reading the story uh almost enjoy it at, at the surface level of just you know let's play a little bit with the afterlife maybe there's uh, a, a a place where we can think about death in a way that's not quite so scary. Um, and we can think about uh, notions of, of permanence and relevance and history and uh, um, things that are, you know, often big, scary issues that, that confront all of us and, and look at them in a way that's just a little bit silly. I love that. A little bit of humor is going to get us through. <laughs> So I think um, we have time for one more question. So I just like to ask, you know, moving forward, I mean, I imagine you both have a lot more writing to keep on doing. Do you feel as though writing um, these particular books, you know, or what you will in Afterlife Crisis have influenced the way you write moving forward, particularly um, in terms of your relationship from like author to character? You can also probably, say Probably, no. <laughs> probably not for me because all of my books are different from each other and I tend to get bored easily. Um, uh, Theresa Nielsen Hayden, the editor, says that there are some authors who are like dogs and they learn to do a trick and then they'll repeat that trick. And there's other authors who are like otters and they learn to do a trick and then they're like, done that trick now, let's learn a different trick. And uh, I'm definitely in the in the otter camp there of I, I want to do a different trick. So I'm like, I, I, uh, I've, I've done the fourth wall book uh now i'm gonna do different different things um yeah oh, wonderful how about you randall well I, I sort of aspire to be like joe where i have a whole bunch of different types of books uh right now i i sort of am rooted in two worlds so i have my academic writing on the one hand and my uh, uh my fiction on the other and uh for me it's sort of unfortunate when they uh, they bleed into each other without me intending for that to happen. I, I found myself writing an academic piece a little while back about legal ethics, and legal theory. And I suddenly realized I was about five pages in and I was writing in Rennick's voice. And that hadn't been the plan at all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he uh, he took over my, my nonfiction writing. So uh, uh, I, I would like to be as disciplined as Joe and train myself to uh, uh, be very different in my writing from uh, uh, one piece to the next, but I'm not quite there yet. I completely understand. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, I think that's all the time we have. I just wanted to thank you again both so much for being here. This has been such a delight. Both of your books are so wonderful. It was such a pleasure to read. So,
Hello, viewers. Please go out, pick them up. Again, we have Baca Phoenix available with the books and also go check out the digital marketplace. It's gorgeous. Maya, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us for this great conversation. This was so enjoyable. And thank you for spending uh, some time with us this morning. Um, so yeah, you can find Afterlife Crisis by Randall Graham or What You Will by Joe Walton and Two Dark Moons by Avi Silver at the Baca Phoenix Bookshop. Uh, at www.bacafoenixbooks.ca. Uh, we will be back at 12.30 uh, Eastern Time for Derek Prinskin's conversation with self-published superstars, Nandy Taylor, E. Latimer, and K.S. Filoso. So we will see you back then. Thank you very much, everyone.
Hello, and welcome back to the Ideas and Imagination stream. Uh, the panel we have up next for you is called Self-Published Superstar Stories, and we're joined now by our moderator, Derek Kunskin. Derek has built genetically engineered viruses, worked with street children and refugees in Latin America, served as a Canadian diplomat, and most importantly, taught his son about superheroes and science. His short fiction has appeared in Analog Science Fiction and Fact, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and multiple times in Asimov's Science Fiction. His stories have been adapted into audio podcasts, reprinted in various year's best anthologies, and translated into multiple languages. They've also been shortlisted for various awards, and won the Asimov's Reader's Award in 2013. He tweets from at Derek Kunskin, blogs at blackgate.com, and makes his internet home at derekkunskin.com. And today he joins us here live on StreamYard. Hi, Derek. Hi, Maya. How are you? Not too bad. How are you today? Great, great. Thanks for being for having me here. Absolutely. I'll let you take it away. Sounds great. So welcome to uh, the panel called Self-Published Superstar Stories. And the description here is readers always wonder, how do authors get their start? Hear from three fantasy superstars, Nandi Taylor, E. Latimer, and K.S. Villoso, who navigated the world of self-publishing with aplomb. I'm going to give their bios, and then we're going to do uh, three minutes of reading from each one, and then we'll get into the discussion. So Nandi Taylor is a Canadian writer of Afro-Caribbean descent based in Toronto. Her debut novel, Given, garnered over one million reads on the online story-sharing Wattpad and earned a starred review from the ALA's Booklist magazine. Common themes she writes about are growth, courage, and finding one's place in the world. Hi, Nandi. Hi there, how are you? I'm great, I'm great. And you're gonna do a reading for us now? Uh, I sure will, um, from my debut novel, Given. Um, so this book actually started out on Wattpad. Um, it's the one where I got the, the million reads and it's kind of a testament to how, um, you know, putting your stuff online really can help you get that, uh, get in front of audience that, audiences that maybe you couldn't before. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll read from just the very start, um, and that will kind of give you a flavor for what the story's about. Okay, so we're starting right at page one, chapter one. Uh, Yenny made her decision as her cousin slithered through the grass like log snakes, hemming the creature in from all sides. They would hate her for this. She pulled energy through her focus rune, a band of white painted across her eyes, and felt its warm tingle on her skin as it sharpened her vision. Ahead, the ne shimmered in the sunlight, the black hair of its haunches flashing blue, then green, then gold. It grazed, its graceful neck bent forward, and its tall horns curved and gleaming like blackwood. Four long legs suited to loping sprints uh, disappeared into the tall grass. Such a gorgeous creature. Small wonder her cousins wanted to skin it, put its head on display, and make a cape of its pelt. But Nan were highly intelligent. It was rare to see more than one or two at a time, and the scholars theorized that they sacrificed themselves to draw predators away from the main herd. In fact, Yenny was certain it knew they were there. At any moment, it would draw on the ache of divine energy that ran through all things and put on a magical burst of speed to dart away. She planned to help it escape. Yenny heard a bird trill, high and sweet, and recognized it as the signal that one of her cousins, or perhaps her younger brother, was in place. Another bird call, and another. They would not attack with fire. That would singe the poor creature's hide. No, they would chase the poor thing this way and that until they could catch it. And then someone would snap its neck with their bare hands, if she let them. Yang moved through the grass clumsily, causing it to shake and shiver around her. The formation was still incomplete. Run, she thought desperately. As if it had hurt her, the creature took off, its legs glowing with ache as it galloped through the tall grass. Yenny flared the speed runes on her thighs and calves, relishing the familiar warmth of energy coursing through her, and shot after it. Two of her cousins jumped up out of the grass. Weh, weh, they shouted, waving their arms. The Ne zipped right, where her younger brother Jimmy kept pace, his runes blazing blue-white on his dark legs. He dove, arms wide, to tackle the Ne, but it slipped free and left him tumbling. Yenny grinned until she realized the creature now ran right at her. If she scared it, it would turn tail and head straight for her cousin, Adeige, who would no doubt catch it, and then... Yenny sprang out of the path of the runaway Ne, flattening herself to the grass. The ground vibrated as it thundered past, and she heard her cousin let out a frustrated curse. Mothers and fathers that escaped into the forest will never find it now. Standing, Yenny brushed herself off while mentally tensing against the tyrant to come. 
She did feel a small stab of guilt for ruining the hunt, but it was her last trip for a long while to come, and she refused to taint the memory. The pale grass of the plain against the soft blue of the sky with the tang of the beautiful animal's red blood. How are we doing for time? Good? That was great. <laughs> I love the world building. Thank okay. you. Okay, we'll, we'll get into the conversation as soon as the other readers have done. So thank you, Nandi. You're welcome. I'd like to introduce now uh, E. Latimer. Uh, she is the author of Witches of Ash and Ruin and the Strange and Deadly Portraits of Bryony Gray. She lives on Vancouver Island and her breakout success on the online writing platform Wattpad has resulted in a fan base of over 100,000 followers with over 20 million combined reads. She also vlogs weekly from the World Nerds YouTube channel. Hi, Erin, how are you? Hi, I'm great, thank you, how are you? Great, thank you. Uh, you've got uh, something to read to us as well? I do. I'm going to read a little excerpt from Witches of Ash and Ruin. Um, this is chapter one. Um, chapter one, dub. The best way to hunt a witch was to look for patterns of three. Three stones set into a wild, overgrown path. Three chimneys sending twisting ribbons of smoke into a clear sky. Three gates before the inner sanctuary, each more heavily spelled than the last. Find the house of threes and you'd find the coven. Dove had traveled for days. In fact, he'd almost driven past the place. His tourist map was filled with colorful pins at every stopover. Kiss the Blarney Stone, visit the Irish National Heritage Park. But this miserable little village didn't even warrant a mention. He'd blown past the welcome sign without a glance, almost continuing into country Wexford. Almost. Something had pulled at his insides as he'd reached the village limits, tugging painfully at his guts. He turned the rental car around and followed the sensation down a rambling back road that twisted endlessly through green fields, leading him to this driveway in the woods. And there it was, a farmhouse with three crooked chimneys, windows shuttered against the dark forest. The witch hunter watched the house. There was something unnatural about how still he was the type of stillness reserved for death or very deep water. He set his back to one of the oak trees lining the driveway, an ashy cigarette hanging between two fingers. The ember burned orange in the darkness, sending a thin spiral of smoke trickling up. At his feet, spent filters scattered the ground. He knew why he'd been called. There were too many witches here for one small town. They were gathering. In his pocket, his cell phone buzzed violently, and Dove shut his eyes. He raised the cigarette to his lips and took a drag. In, burning his lungs, filling his insides with fire. Out, tipping his head back, blowing smoke onto the breeze. He knew who was on the phone. It rang again. His brothers were in town. Soon they'd be reunited. After years of faded recollections and fuzzy, half-dreamed memories, he hadn't even been sure they were real. And yet he did not wish to speak with them before it was time. Eventually, the phone went silent. Dove watched the house. Minutes passed. Flies buzzed around his head with the smoke and his left arm ached. When he glanced down, four long scratches trailed along his forearm. The women had all felt the same until now, a fleeting enjoyment. They'd stirred feelings in him, fire and righteousness, the way they'd stared at him, dark eyes, pale faces, their hair caught in his fingers, their screams in his ears. This morning had been enough to sate him temporarily, but he was never fully satisfied. He hadn't known what he was looking for. He hadn't remembered until now. There was a little witch in every woman, but not every woman was a witch. This would be different. The power rolled off this house in waves. It raised the hairs on the back of his neck and sent goosebumps up both arms. These witches would give him the first real fight in years. He ran his tongue along the inside of his teeth, feeling the jagged edge of his right canine. Not yet. He'd attend to the others first. His sword was ready. Witch killer would taste blood again. In a few weeks, he'd return, push his way through the middle gate, the one with a black iron that curved into fangs at the top. Something to look forward to to make the days go by faster. He always saved the best for last. Great. I love the imagery of uh, the sets of threes. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce now K.S. Villoso, who writes speculative fiction with a focus on deeply personal themes and character-driven narratives. Much of her work is inspired by her childhood in the slums of Taguig, Philippines. She is now living amidst the forest and mountains with her husband, children, and dogs in Anmore, B.C. Welcome, Kay. 
Hi, thanks for having me. <clears throat> and you've got uh, something to read today too? Uh, yes, I'm reading from my book, The Wolf of Orin Yarrow. I'm gonna start in chapter one. They called me the bitch queen, the she-wolf, because I murdered a man and exiled my king the night before they crowned me. Hurricanes destroy the villages and they call it senseless. The winter winds come and they call it cold. What else did I expect from my people, the Oreñaro, the ambitious savages who created a war that nearly ripped Jin Yang apart? I almost think that if my reign had started without bloodshed and terror, they would have been disappointed. I did not regret killing the man. He had it coming and my father had taught me to take action before you second guess yourself. My father was a wise man and if the warlords could have stopped arguing long enough to put their misgivings behind him, he would have made them a great king. Instead, they entrusted the land to me and my husband, children of that same war they would rather forget. The gods love their ironies. I do regret looking at the bastard while he died. I regret watching his eyes roll backwards and the blood spread like a cobweb underneath his wilted form, leaking into the cracked cobblestone my father paid a remarkable amount of money to install. I regret not having a sharper sword and losing my nerve so that I didn't strike him again, and he had to die slowly. Bleeding over the jasmine bushes, that whole batch of flowers would remain pink until the end of the season. He had stared up at the trail of stars in the night sky and called for his mother. Even though he was a traitor, he didn't deserve the pain. More than anything, I regret not stopping my husband. I should have run after him, groveled at his feet, asked him to stay. But in nursing my own pride, I didn't give his a chance. I watched his tall, straight back grow smaller in the distance. His father's helmet nestled under his arm, his unbound hair blowing in the wind, and I did nothing. A wolf of Oreñaro suffers in silence. A wolf of Oreñaro does not beg. Almost at once, the rumors spread like wildfire. They started in the great hall in the castle at Okashto when I arrived for my coronation, dressed in my mother's best silk dress, all white like a virgin on her wedding day, bedecked with pearls and gold weave, with no husband at my side. My son, also in white, stood on the other side of the days with his nursemaid, between us were the true priests tasked with the ceremony, a priest of the god Akateru, patron deity of Oreñaro, and a priest of Kibori, that foreign religion my husband's clan favored with their nameless maker and enough text to make anyone ill. They could pass for brothers with their long faces, carp-like whiskers and leathery skin the color of honey. My husband's absence was making everyone uncomfortable. I, on the other hand, drifted between boredom and restlessness. I glanced at my son. He had stopped crying, but the red around his eyes had yet to disappear. It was my fault. On the way to the great hall, he asked for his father like any two-year-old would, and I snapped in return. He's gone, I told him in that narrow corridor where only the nursemaid could hear. He doesn't want us anymore. Eight. Wow, you guys did amazing with uh, three minutes for reading is a very challenging uh, length. So your, re your reads are amazing. Um, so we're here to talk today. I mean, we've got the cross section of self-publishing and we've also got the question of how people started as, as, as writers. And so I wanted to ask you, all three of you, um, just when did you know you wanted to write? Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Nandi. Yeah, thanks. And just a short thing. I I pronounce it Nandi with a long A. Nandi, Although okay. it is a South, Af a South African name and South Africans will pronounce it Nandi. So I'm kind of flexible, but okay. Back to the question at hand. How did, when did I want to, uh, no, I wanted to start writing. Um, it's hard to say. It was, it was pretty much since I learned how to read and how to write. I mean, I was writing little stories um, when I was in grade three, I used to write what I now realize was Power Rangers fan fiction. And I would put all the members of my class into the uh, the fan fiction and, and turn them into different Power Rangers at, a, at creative writing time. Um, and I think that that is, uh, <laughs> that was definitely my first um, 
foray into writing. Um, but I do kind of blame my parents for the fact that I'm now a published fantasy author because when I was a kid, they used to read to me um, from this book called Fairy and Folk Tales. Um, and it's this gorgeous um, illustrated book of fairy tales um, from this uh, old Italian press. I don't even know if they're around anymore. Um, and they would read me stories from all over the world. Um, you had stories of like uh, Australian Aboriginal folk tales, Indian folk tales, um, Native American. Um, there was a uh, West African. So I was getting, you know, these kind of magical stories from all over the world. Um, and that really, I kind of sunk into my subconscious. I think it ignited this love of fantasy um, and it kind of also ignited this this desire in me to see more fantasy featuring um, people who looked like me. Because I, I, when I was a teenager or, and a preteen, I went out looking for fantasy stories and I found them. Uh, I found things like Lord of the Rings, Terry Brooks, um, books that were very good, very imaginative, and also very Eurocentric. Um, so that kind of made me uh, realize when I started my own writing that I wanted to write books that uh, focused on me a little bit, where I felt like I belonged. Very cool. Uh, Kay, what about you? When did you know you wanted to write? I, I also started writing really young, like I think maybe in first grade. I started with short stories, and it just it became really addictive to me to be to be telling stories and making my own entertainment which like i didn't have a lot of access to books it, it like you know you would go to the store and maybe get one book every like few months and so i i just it became a habit for me to make my own entertainment my own stories and i think i was around maybe 10 when i started going into novels and from then i just didn't really stop i just i kept writing and writing yeah. <laughs> wow. And and what about you, Erin? Um, I I'm the same way. Uh, in kindergarten, I um, humiliatingly so my mother kept one of my uh, kindergarten masterpieces that was called Charlie and the Cool Cats, and it was about a gang of house cats who played hacky sack. And it was in one of those like kindergarten composition books. So I started very young and kind of graduated to um, yeah fanfic of like terrible self-insert Star Wars fanfic um, and that kind of thing. So yeah, and it's funny because um, I also blame my love of writing fantasy and being a um, published fantasy author on my parents, but for a very different reason because they banned me from reading fantasy at one point because we were very, at the time we were very conservative Christian. Um, and so of course it became all I wanted to read and I snuck mm -hmm. it and hid it under my bed and read it nonstop. So yeah, just for a very different reasons, I blame my parents as well. <laughs> Interesting, the commonality of the uh, origin stories of all of you. <laughs> um, so self-publishing, so so you, you, it sounds like in grade school, each of you had a very strong interest in writing and now we, we Fast forward to adulthood, I suppose, and you know there are there are methods of publishing now that didn't even exist when we were kids. Um, why did you start with self-publishing? Uh, does anybody um, like what, what? What 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 drew you to that side of the publishing industry? Mm -hmm. um, Not, I can I can start. Yeah. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, as I, I think I touched on it a little bit before my reading, but um, I just wanted a way to. <laughs> This is going to sound arrogant. I knew I had enough confidence in my writing that if I just put it out into the world, it, it would find its audience, you know? And so I just really needed a way to um, get my writing in front of a lot of people just to see what would happen, you know? Um, and I think, um, so at the time I was writing this story, Wattpad was pretty much the biggest um, and prettiest website for um, like serially fictionalizing your your work um, that wasn't geared toward fan fiction. Because I, while I started out with that bomb Power Rangers fan fiction, I was by then I was into you know writing my own stuff. So I wanted a place where people were looking for that, and that's why I started serializing it on Wattpad. I figured um, you know I'll get involved with the community um, and see what what happens if I can get this to take off. And it caught the eye of, um, you know, the editorial team. Uh, I won uh, one of the uh, Wadi's awards, uh, Wadi's World Builder Award. And that kind of 
the rest is history, as they say. Cool. And what about you, Kay? Um, I started trying to query traditionally, and that took seven years of rejections before I finally, like, I just wanted to focus on the writing. I didn't want to focus on trying to get to the gate, and I wanted to focus on the writing and reaching my audience directly. So at the time, self-publishing was starting to take off, and like, so, so I, with a group of friends to like help edit my work, I put it out in uh, 2015. So I wrote this the, this first novel with the intention of self-publishing it, and then I finished that trilogy. And then The Wolf of Orinyaro was supposed to be like the second series that I was working on. And I released that one in 2018. And the reception to that was like way better than with the, with the previous series. And in just like a couple, of, uh, a few months, uh, I got an email from who would later be my editor. Uh, and basically Orbit Books picked up my, my book just a few months after I self-published that. And then, you know, the, the whole series was picked up and yeah, the, the rest is history from there. Wow. And, and what about you, Erin? Um, yeah, I, sort of similar as Kay, I started out um, querying traditional, traditional path, I guess, um, for literary agents. And um, it was always my intention to kind of be like a hybrid publisher or author, I should say. Um, but I knew it was going to be a long and like sometimes painful process. And Wattpad at the time kind of felt like my outlet, my creative outlet um, for not only um, being able to put my stories out there and having that wonderful audience feedback, but also um, finding like a community of like minded fantasy writers. Um, and yeah, like some of my best friends I met on Wattpad and we've met in l real life uh, many times now, like the Wattpad 4, we're running chats and stuff for a while. Um, and, and yeah, it was just like this wonderful welcoming community with no gatekeepers. Um, and I kind of like needed that for my sanity. Um, and of course, like um, Briarney Gray and Witches of Ash and Ruin are both traditionally published. Um, but I definitely am still on act active on Wattpad still like I don't intend to change that and yeah I definitely want to be have my fingers in all the different pies going forward um, and so yeah Wattpad was kind of like a safe haven for me and that's how I started out. So it sounds like all three of you went to Wattpad first were, were there any other self-publishing venues that might have been of interest or were like runners up or was Wattpad the only one you guys were interested in? Um, well, like I was saying before, the the reason I chose Wattpad was just because it was the, mo the most well-known, the biggest uh, audience. Um, I didn't want to try, say, publishing through um, Amazon um, just because I felt like the the scope of the marketing to get um, get through all the noise was very daunting to me. I actually, I didn't go through Wattpad. I went through... I went to Amazon myself, and as Nandi was saying, it's it it is tough to get visibility there. It is. <laughs> I went through. Uh, I I went through and contacted bloggers to try to get a word out on my book, but it, it it's it's tough, like, especially mm -hmm. now. The environment is very pay to play. Wow, Erin. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I will say. Um, I've, I've tried a couple of different things. Um, Wattpad has definitely been like my absolute favorite thing I did for a while um take what like frost at the time had like 10 million views or something and I went well I might as well publish it um and I try I did like the kindle direct thing and on Amazon and everything and I found it um overwhelming uh I just don't I don't think that I uh I don't think I had at the time the like marketing skills and even just like the publishing skills. I'm not a publisher. Um, and so going forward, having that experience, I know that eventually I will, like I said, I will be a hybrid publisher. I will be on Amazon, but I know from my past experience, I'm going to have somebody else handle that part, the publishing, the marketing. Um, so it'll be a career move for me. But now that I've had that experience, I know 
that I'm going to do it a bit differently. Um, I also have been through like a self-publishing co-op, it was called, which was very interesting. Um, at the time it was called Book Trope, um, where kind of, it was kind of the same thing. You'd assemble teams and they would do other parts of the publishing process for you. And I found that was a very fun collaborative thing. Um, the company did end up going under, um, but again, it was another unique experience, which was very interesting and helped clear up some things that um, I want to maybe run with in the future. So, yeah. And I imagine that there's more than a few people in the audience who are, you know, looking looking at the three of you as as role models for for their aspirations for their career. Um, to, if in case people don't know, could could one of you or several of you talk about how Wattpad works and and um, like what the general deal is for uh, for writers who go to Wattpad? Um, yeah, you've been on there the longest, I think, uh, or Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm, I'm the oldest. <laughs> I feel like I've been on there forever. Um, essentially, yeah, it's um, like Nandi was saying before, it's very much like a place to put serialized fiction. Um, that's its strong suit, essentially. So you kind of go in and you can post uh, chapter by chapter. Um, and updates, I, I used to do updates every Wednesday. Um, and it's a really good place to gain an audience um, who knows, oh, okay, um, E. Latimer posts every Wednesday. I'm going to come, I'm going to vote on it. I'm going to comment on it. Um, and then uh, you you gain fans as you go along, the more exposure your story gets. Um, yeah, it's a really, really good place to start out and also get um, feedback from people. Um, I know with Frost, it was literally a case of me posting an update every Wednesday and people being like, I think this is going to happen next or you should have this happen next. And I could be like, oh, this is really fun. I can incorporate some of this and, you know, keep the readers guessing. And then they, they get really excited when their guesses come true. Uh, mm -hmm. like that. So it's very interactive, which is wonderful. Other thoughts? Uh, do you guys keep the rights like it's uh oh, yeah. so yeah. it's it's up to you how long it's on wattpad yes um i am part of what's called the stars program which sounds really a little pretentious but um basically it means you sign a contract and you still keep all of the rights to your stories um, but you have to give them like a 30 days notice or something before you take it off. Cause it, when you're in that program, um, you basically are giving them rain to shop your stories. So they'll go to like HBO or they'll go to Amazon prime and be like, do you want to work with this author? Uh, what do you think of this story that she has? Um, so I've just signed a contract that lets them do that, but they know that they have to work with my agent. So one thing I've really liked about Wattpad is that they, they're all the, the staff there is professional. So when you sign a contract like that, they know they're working with your agent. They know um, that everything's worked out in paperwork. Um, so, so there's also on Wattpad a lot of opportunity to not just find your community, but like, I mean, this is a little open, but honestly, 2020 is plague year and Wattpad is the only thing that's making me money right now right basically um which again is why i really love being a hybrid author <laughs> but yeah so so i'll the next thing i have is uh like self-publishing as some of you have alluded to is i mean you have to have a lot of different skill sets like it's not just the writing and editing and storytelling so so what um what did self-publishing teach you uh that you now you know feel it's helped you level up in your career mm -hmm. um I'd say on, on my end, it taught me the importance of um, community and networking um, and word of mouth. And that's true, I think, whether you're self-published or traditionally published. I mean, you get a little bit of that leg up when you're traditionally published, um, which I am now through Wattpad Books because they started their own uh, publishing company, oh. kind of poached me from the site. Um, but because you get your marketing stuff, but you still need that word of mouth. To, to like, there's a lot of noise out there. Pe there, you're competing with not only other authors, you're competing with YouTube, you're competing with Netflix. There's a lot of things people could be doing besides reading your book. Um, and so getting onto uh, 
uh, social media. I know people, some people hate, uh, it's a, a bad word to them, but you really kind of have to get that social media going, doubly so if you're um, self-published. And I think of Wattpad as a form of social media. Okay, okay. Uh, it taught me a lot about marketing and just by that, I mean having an idea of the audience of your particular project, which it, right now is helping me just kind of like when you're making story decisions, what, before you write a novel, just thinking of how is this gonna be marketed? Who are you gonna be directing it to? And I think in a way it helped, it helped me gain some clarity on the industry, which made, I feel like it made my craft stronger because now I'm not focused so much on trying to like jump through hoops and more thinking, you know, like, because, because there's the art part and then there's the part that's the business, which is, the product and being as being self-published basically taught me a lot about like like being able to separate myself from doing the art and then now that the art's done you know focusing on the business side of it and then how are you going to market this product who are you going to direct it to any last thoughts Aaron on that um yeah i i would say that um attempting to self-publish and realizing like, oh my God, this is overwhelming, um, was a really valuable experience to teach me like what my strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and then also with Wattpad, honestly, by the time that um, Bryony Gray came out, um, I had been on Wattpad for so long that the negative reviews did not bother me. Um, so that was a huge plus. I could go on Goodreads and be like, eh, it's fine because um, you you really do learn to um, it's a wonderful community but you really do learn to um, take everybody's comments with a grain of salt um, and then to have thick skin which as an author is really important yeah um, is so for again the the members of the audience who are coming here and looking at you know maybe one day I want to self-publish maybe in a year or two when I've got everything edited and and great um, the advice that we're talking about now, the experiences that you've had that have led to book deals and agents and stuff like that, which is amazing. Um, is the world of self-publishing the same now as it was when you started or has it like, does it shift so fast that like in two years, do you expect that the, the things that you've learned now will, will not apply so much? Or are there some things that are kind of crystallized that, that stay the way it is? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, things are shifting very fast. I think one thing that's changed and it affects um, traditionally and self-published authors is how much you need to be a public figure as opposed to say 10 years back. I remember dreaming about being an author. I thought I would just be able to write my little books and put them out and everyone would find them in the bookstore in the library and maybe I'd get some emails every once in a while about how awesome I am. Um, but no, you really do have to hustle and um, it's expected really that you kind of um, uh, are front facing and, and accessible to an extent uh, to your readers. Um, so I think when you're self-publishing, that's, that's something that you need to keep in mind. You, um, you know, you've got to uh, be connecting with bloggers. You should probably need your own blog. You need an Instagram. You need a Twitter. Um, I think Facebook. I so I didn't go the Amazon route, um, where I was doing my own marketing and stuff like that. But I I hear that Facebook is still pretty important for that. Although Facebook is um, uh, becoming less and less popular. Um, I think maybe um, Kay or Aaron could speak more to to the uh, technical marketing aspects of self-publishing and how they're changing. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it keeps changing. It like a few years back, you could just drop a book on Amazon and you might be able to get readers for it. Especially when a uh, Kindle unlimited came out, it, it was, it, it was the, like, it was like golden years and you didn't need to know too much. Just nail the fundamentals of the cover. Like if you're going for epic fantasy, there's someone holding a sword there and you might be able to get that to fly. Now it's becoming so much harder to get that, to get the algorithms working for you. And uh, 
what's happening now is that you have to start paying to be able to get that visibility that a few years ago Amazon was giving out for free. Mm-hmm. So I think um, maybe they were doing some <laughs> shady stuff there, but now it's it's becoming more expensive. And I think if you are going the Amazon route, you have to be prepared to have some marketing dollars to use for AMS and Facebook because it's just so much harder. Like bids are now really expensive, especially in Facebook. If you try to do really detailed targeting, it goes up. Like you could easily spend like a dollar per click and nobody's going to buy for a dollar per click. You have to know like the, the, the data for how many people you need to click on an ad before they buy your book and you still make a profit, which is right now it's very hard to make a profit on just one book on Amazon. You need, so you need a plan when you're going down that route. And yeah, it's probably going to change in two years. It, it just keeps changing. It, it's crazy. Like I, when I first released my book, I, uh, when I first released in 2015, I could get sales and I didn't have the greatest cover. Like I could get sales without doing anything. I, I feel like it's so much harder to do that now. Mm. Aaron? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Kay. I think that it's getting more saturated and I think um, uh, just the accessibility of it, which is great. Um, but I also think that um, as traditional publishers slow down, essentially, like, uh, you know, it used to be the big five and, or sorry, it used to be the big six, now it's the big five, and they're getting more and more picky, especially right now. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've been on sub and then had a book rejected. Um, and I think that people are getting frustrated, understandably so, and going to self-publishing because it is more accessible, it, there is no gatekeepers. And I think that that has flooded the market. And yeah, like Kay said, it's hard to get noticed now. And I think that's just gonna continue to happen. That's not to say that you shouldn't go out and do that because I think that also self-publishing is really valuable in that we can hit the ground running um, because you aren't, restricted by the dinosaur of traditional publishing. You you can grow and change as things grow and change. Um, so obviously everything's gonna have, um, you know, pros and cons, but that is one of the, con- uh, the pros of self-publishing is that um, you can adapt just as fast as the world is, is changing essentially. Yeah, um, I was at a Science Fiction Writers of America conference a few years ago, and um, self-publishing writers were giving talks on how to do things. And some of, like, just it, it's it's a little bit terrifying to think about how you know in you know the 15 years ago it was your bookseller at your bookshop who kind of picked the books and could talk to the books that are on the shelves and stuff like that. And now that sort of pre-selection system is being done by algorithms and that people are figuring out what the algorithms are. And as soon as they figure out what the algorithms are, then the algorithms have to fight back to not get distorted and stuff. And so I think this speaks uh, to Kay's point that, you know, what what was visible before is no longer visible now. Uh, it's, um, it's a really dynamic field, um, but you guys have all been really successful at it, it seems. Yeah. Sorry, Nandi, did you want to comment too? Um, I, I don't have too much more to add than than what I was saying about um, the need for being creative and, and kind of knowing how to you can jive when it comes to um, being visible because it, you're constantly fighting, like you said, these changing algorithms um, and the changing means of interacting with people and, you're, and there's more and more uh, things competing for people's attention. Yeah. So um, if if there are people in the audience looking at your careers as models, um, would you give them a piece of advice or two? Like what, what sorts of things would you say to them that you wished you could have, you know, transmitted back in time 10 or 15 years to yourself? Mm-hmm. Um, what, what sorts of uh, advice would you offer to people watching? It's, it's difficult. I don't know what I could have done differently other, other than keep grinding. You know, I was just putting out stories. I've been putting stories online on different websites for like 15 years. Um, and I think um, Wattpad was the one that kind of helped me tap into the biggest audience. Um, and the one that um, had the resources to kind of take me to the next step. 
Um, and so being published through Wattpad Books has really kind of opened um, some very nice doors for me, um, allowed me to get agented, um, allowed me to be able to see my book in bookstores, which I don't know, I don't think I'll ever get used to that. Um, and, uh, but for anyone who's trying to break in now, um, a lot of it, and if, you, if you're not where you wanna be, don't feel too bad, because a lot of it is luck. Um, a good portion of it is luck, um, but you, it's, um, what's the saying, preparation, meeting opportunity. So you just got to keep at it until, you know, the opportunity comes and so that you're ready to, to take advantage of it. Okay. Uh, yeah. As Nandi said, the, it's a lot of it is luck. So you have to keep trying, but at the same time, don't over-focus on the discoverability. And I feel like you have to focus 100% on, like 100%, most of, most of your effort should be going into craft. It should be going into making your story powerful. Like you, that old saying that be so good, they can't ignore you. And because it, you can focus so much on trying to be discovered, but if your work can't stand it, like it can't, stand the, the test of time it's mm -hmm. it, it it's a lot of that effort it's wasted put your effort first into making the craft really stand out and then when you go and like try to find visibility for it it's going to be so much easier for you and and on that point then how how did each of you improve your craft um, because I remember when I was trying to learn how to write, I, I felt like I was on a treadmill, not going anywhere, no matter how much I tried. And um, I think I think many people feel that way. So what what were the learning? What were the bits that accelerated your learning? Uh, I guess I can start on that one. Um, well, Pat helped a lot. Um, I remember, uh, Aaron, you were saying the one thing that uh, you liked was the feedback from people where people would say, oh, I think this is going to happen next. I kind of had an opposite reaction to that, where if they guessed what was going to happen, I was like, oh, fine, <laughs> now I have to change it. Um, so I kind of learned how to get better at um, creating twists um, through, through having that kind of uh, level of feedback. Because if you got like 50 people guessing the same twist... <laughs> God, it's humbling. Uh, so you go in there and you fix it. Um, also reading other people's stories is a great way um, to improve your own craft. Um, you'll see the way people use certain turns of phrase, um, how, how people um, set up the rhythm of their prose, sprinkle in metaphors, things like this. Um, or you might read something that you think is really bad and say, ah, yeah, I don't think I wanna emulate that. Um, so I would say that's a, a lot of reading um, has been part of improving my craft. Also reading books on craft just to get that inspiration and kind of go in and um, figure out the nuts and bolts of what I'm doing um, and be more more um, deliberate about um, what I'm writing and the emotions and reactions that I'm drawing from readers. Yeah. What about you, Erin? Were there any accelerants or epiphanies that helped you improve your craft so you would get the word of mouth when luck struck? Definitely, um, definitely beta reading other people was a, a huge, huge thing. And I know that some authors have been like, oh, don't beta read somebody that's like a few levels beneath you, beneath you as far as like writing goes. Um, because you won't get the same, you know, give and take out of it. But I actually really disagree with that because um, I found reading like more beginner writing, um, I would see patterns in it and I would be like, oh, I'm doing that too. And I'm realizing that sounds like kind of odd on the page or it, it sounds stilted. Um, so I actually really feel like it teaches you about your own writing to, um, to, to beta read a lot. Um, and then of course reading. Um, and I would do this thing where I would read a book for pleasure. And if I really liked it and I, it really evoked some certain emotion for me, or if I was really engaged by it, I would go back and I would read it again um, and sort of take it apart a little bit and figure out how the author was doing what they were doing essentially. What about you, Kay? Um, the, one of the things about self-publishing is that, like I said, it, it directs you, con it, 
it directs you, it, it, you're connected directly to the audience. Mm -hmm. So it, you're not protected by like your agent and editor first, you, you know, you know, everything goes straight to them and their reaction is something that, you know, you have to work with and maybe not always trying to make them happy, but if you're achieving, like if you're not achieving with your work in your audience, you're not achieving the reaction that you're, you were looking for, then that that's something that, you know, you have to sit with and help. So, so maybe you're not necessarily doing something wrong, but there's something that you could be stronger at. Like you could be more direct to the points because you can see in your audience, if they're confused or they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just, you know, they're not connecting. You can easily go back and, and improve on the next book. That reminds me of a, a story about the Beatles where um, they were talking about their time in Hamburg when they were still nobodies and yet they played. And if they didn't play well enough and entertaining enough, the Germans would yell at them and say, Mach show, Mach show, which means be more entertaining. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> the, they, they, they went through that grind too of that, that feedback. Um, no, that's fascinating. No, this has been really uh, eye-opening for me. I appreciate it. And we've got about a minute left and I would love a chance to give each of you a chance to A, tell people where to find your work and then B, maybe if people want to follow you on social media. So maybe we'll start with Nandi. Okay, so you can find my book given at um, bookstores all over uh, Canada and the US and um, the UK. Uh, it's on uh, Amazon as well. Um, and I'm on social media. I'm on uh, Twitter, uh, Nandi underscore Taylor. And I'm on Instagram at uh, Nandi T author. Uh, and then you can also find me on my website, which is just uh, NandiTaylor.com. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so you can find my book anywhere that you buy books. <laughs> the sequel just came out like a few days ago. So, you know, you don't have to wait too long. And you can find me on, I don't know if you can see. <laughs> you can find me on social media. You can just look look the book up. <laughs> It'll show up. What about you, Erin? Uh, so you can find Witches of Ash and Ruin at any bookstore. And same with The Strange and Deadly Portraits of Byrony Gray. Um, you can find me almost anywhere under E. Latimer Writes. I'm on Twitter, sort of. Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, and I also vlog a lot over on YouTube. So I'm at Word Nerds um, or Word Nerds Vlog. If you look that up, you should find us on YouTube. And we do like live chats um, every Sunday, Sunday night, actually, um, especially for Nano coming up. We do lots of word sprints. Um, so we're always happy to have people join us and we just chat and don't get as much writing done as we should. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you on stream and a pleasure to hear from you all. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, we will be back in 15 minutes for another conversation modded by Derek Kunskin uh, with Sean Michaels and Natalie Zena Walshots. Uh, you can find Given, uh, which is of Ash, Ash and Ruin, and the Equisar Falcon or um, at Back of Phoenix Books. And we will return momentarily. So thank you so much.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Ideas and Imagination stream. Please welcome back to the stream our moderator, Derek Kunskin. Hi, hey. Derek. How are you? Doing really well. For those of you who missed the last segment, just a brief reintroduction. Derek has built genetically engineered viruses, worked with street children and refugees in Latin America, served as a Canadian diplomat, and most importantly, taught his son about superheroes and science. He tweets from at Derek Kunskin, blogs at blackgate.com, and makes his internet home at derekkunskin.com. So nice to see you. Same here. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. We're here to talk about uh, gray areas. And uh, this uh, is the, the question of good versus evil. And we have Natalie uh, Sina Walshots and Michael Gray here to muddy the waters and complicate the metaphors with stories that inhabit the gray areas of this magical thing called life. Um, I'm going to introduce them one at a time, and they have some readings for us. Uh, so uh, first up is Natalie Zina Walshots. She's a freelance writer, community yeah. manager, hey, <laughs> and a bailed academic based in Toronto, mm -hmm. which sounds very much like she broke out of jail. Uh, <laughs> she writes Come everything <laughs> from reviews of science fiction novels and hey, interviews you. with heavy metal no. musicians to in-depth feminist games criticism and pieces of long form journalism. She's the author of two books of poetry. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. And you have a reading for us to start with? I do. Um, so I'll be reading from Hench, my new novel here, um, which is, as the title may suggest, um, a story about a young henchwoman who, uh, via a temp agency, is placed on jobs with um, various supervillains. Uh, so this is, uh, in, in light of the fact that we're going to be doing morally gray areas, I thought I would do a brief reading from one of the first uh, major moments when something goes terribly wrong. Sounds great. Okay, everyone, the woman with the call sheet said, clapping her hands for a moment of attention. Remember, your job is to make your boss look impressive. Loom, but don't mean mug too hard. Try to project some intensity, but take your cues from E and don't go overboard. You're, you're like evil bridesmaids. You're here to make him look even better. The meat behind me grumbled at the comparison and I fought against another smile. I tried to project a sense of menace. I indulged in some revenge fantasies and hope that they carried to my face. We're live in 10, the camera operator called and then can count down on his fingers. E sat a little straighter in his makeshift throne. He dramatically steepled his fingers and allowed one corner of his mouth to quirk up the slightest bit. I found myself suddenly gripped by nervousness. With a final thumbs up, we were live. Mr. Mayor, counselors, Chief Danchuk, pardon me for interrupting this municipal, municipal session on what was it, public transit? E paused a moment, mentally counting a few seconds to allow for the sounds of shock and outrage he imagined had erupted on the other side of the closed circuit channel he'd invaded. Please, I promise not to take up too much of your time. At the bottom of the screen, there is a crypto wallet address. This is a very simple ransom demand, the equivalent of $5 million delivered within the next five minutes. Nothing outrageous, nothing that would bankrupt the civic purse, just a little nest egg to get my next project off the ground. He glanced meaningfully across the room where two of his bodyguards had been standing by the door. One of them nodded and touched his earpiece, barking a quick command. The other held the doors open. A third man walked in, any of the other meat, half dragging and half carrying a long-limbed teen boy with him. The kid had grass stains on his knees and was wearing a jersey emblazoned with the logo of a donut shop. He must have been grabbed at soccer practice. As the thick-necked man holding him dragged the boy closer to the desk, I could smell the salt of his, the fresh sweat and a high note of panic. One of the kid's feet was bare and it looked like his own sock was stuffed in his mouth. One of the meat behind me kicked me in the back of the leg and I realized my mouth had been hanging open. I struggled to compose my face. Of course, I understand you need some incentive for such a business position, so let me provide it along with a demonstration of the new project I'm working on. He said jovially and gestured the meat closer. He dragged the boy into the frame of the camera. E paused again for a reaction he couldn't see on the other side of the video feed, then plucked the sock from the boy's mouth. The kid shook his head and spat. I think I'll stop there if that's okay. I don't want to take 
too much of anybody's time. And I figure the impression of the kidnapping has already been rude. Yes, cliffhangers are a wonderful place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like now to introduce Sean Michaels, who is a novelist, short story writer, and critic. Sean's debut novel, Us Conductors, received the Scotiabank Giller Prize, the QWF Paragraph uh, Hugh McClellan Prize for fiction, and was nominated for the Amazon.ca First Novel Award, Kirkus Prize for Fiction, the Dublin Literary Award, and in translation, the Prix des Librairies de Québec. Uh, welcome, Sean. Hi, Derek. Hi, Natalie. It's great to be Hello. here. And you've also got a reading for us. I do. Um, what, wonderful. I find I have done almost none as very little zoomery, uh, and I find this <laughs> very, <laughs> it, I keep, uh, my experience of so much of the pandemic has been waiting for like the, doing something and then being like, oh, but we're gonna do the real version later, right? Like this thought that the normal version will then follow. So it's strange to think that here we are doing word on the street and there's no other word on the street coming. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this is a reading from my second book, The Wagers, uh, here, um, and I'm just gonna start from the top. Nobody remembered Theo Petiris's first joke. Theo himself didn't remember. He'd scribbled his set list on the back of an electricity bill, folded it in fourths, lost it. What he could remember was a room, a stage, a microphone, loud spotlights, crummy comics, tired portraits on the knock-knock club's wall. He recalled the way the darkness crowded around the tables, made it seem safe to laugh. Theo sat alone. He hadn't brought backup, not because he feared being embarrassed, though he did fear this comprehensively, but because he feared the opposite even more, his friend's approval, or rather the semblance of their approval those kind white lies. When Theo went on stage, he wanted to be able to trust whatever happened, to get up and tell a joke and to know without doubt for a few faint seconds whether that joke was any good, whether he was. When the MC called his name, Theo drained his glass. He threw down a balled up napkin and rose to his feet, shuffled through the spectators and up two steps to the stage. He was 24 years old. He wanted more than anything to be a comedian, and at last he would test the premise unassisted. He wrapped two hands around the microphone stand. He hesitated, released his hands, feigned a minor cough. He looked the darkness in the eye. He said, hey, I'm Theo. I've never been here before. Then he told a joke. His heart was a trembling die. They laughed. He told another. They didn't laugh. He told another and another and another, and every one was a way of asking, should I? Should I? Should I? On a Friday 12 years later, Theo still didn't know if he should. Great. Wow. These are two great readings. So uh, welcome to the panel. We're, we're here to talk about uh, gray areas in literature. And I think there's a lot we can do in terms of where we want to go with this conversation. And I think one of the first things is, are we talking about good and evil as, you know, real things? Are we talking about them as kind of, you know, goalposts or guardrails? Are we, are we talking about that gray zone, which is anti-heroes? Uh, how do you interpret uh, this like what's what's your first thought um that's that is a great question i mean what, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the descriptions of my book both that uh have been come up from like people in and on my team and and also like people out in the wild um has been that it's it's very morally gray in that you know a lot of the characters that you're supposed to identify with or kind of be carried along by um do things that are unquestionably bad but um i hope that you understand the reasons that they do them so it's it's not just like you know uh ugly mustache like just lay down on the railroad tracks my idea like cartoon villain like you know 
uh, devil kind of thing, but it's much more like um, you followed the character on the journey that led them to making this choice. And you're not sure maybe that you would make a different one. So that's, that's kind of what that means to me is that it's not necessarily like the good choice, but it might be that person's best choice, um, which are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, but I think we can go in go in a lot of a lot of different directions. Um, you know, I, I sort of I sort of see this uh, this project and um, you know a, a, a lot of my creative work is sort of like a series of trolley problems set up one after the other, where you're kind of deciding who to push in front of the train, um, but you're pushing someone in front of the train. Sean, how about you? It's interesting to think of stories in general as like this uh, exploration of uh, like, tr for lack of a better word, uh, trying to find the light. So, you know, entering into periods of whether it's periods of obscurity and you don't know how they will save themselves from the polar bear that's attacking them, or if it's uh, a moral grayness where you know, you don't know whether the, how the character will figure out what to do for themselves or make the right choice or change or any of those things. And different kinds of books kind of take place or stories take place more in the light or more just in general shadow the whole book. You know, I, I think of fairy story, fairy tales, like, I don't know, something like Jack and the Beanstalk is a very like well lit story. Uh, characters They're advance with obvious, obvious motives and then uh, you know, then it, something happens and you don't quite know how they're going to work out, you know, is he going to go up the beanstalk or not? Is he going to confront the giant or not? Whereas other books kind of just, especially some less plotty books, let's say, just sit in the gloom for, you know, 200, 300 pages as you have the, the character kind of gnaws on their own tongue, trying to work out what to do next. Um, and I think it's interesting, I, I really, when I, as a writer, I've written these two books, but I feel like having a sense of how much light and darkness, how much clarity and confusion, mm -hmm. how much of the book or which part of the book, you know, do you want it to be start all in gloom mm -hmm. and uncertainty and emerge into a place of clarity? Or do you want it to start mm -hmm. with clarity and end with more uncertainty and ambiguity? And it's almost like that, that synesthetic picture of what mm -hmm. I want the book to be, light here, darkness here, um, is, is as important to the kind of the way I imagine the book than anything more clear, like, oh, I really want to wrestle with with uh, moral ambiguity or something. It's mm -hmm. more like, oh, I want the book to see, start, for instance, the wagers, I really want it to seem very well lit and clear and obvious, and then mm -hmm. like, like successive veils to fall over the plot as you think, wait, what, what's happening? Why, where is this going to end up? And then ending in a place of real safety again at the end. Yeah. So in your reading, John, I mean, you you had the you're very overtly trying to ask a question, and I thought that was really interesting as a revelatory sort of thing, and 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 something that the reader will ride on with, right? Because mm -hmm. the question posed that way forces the reader to go. And Natalie, you were talking about trolley problems, one after the other, and stuff. And and I think um, I, I've heard it said that you know the readers identify with somebody who has a strong want and need and you know even if you've got somebody who has some need that's like not what we would want um just the fact that they want it and pursue it makes them more interesting right. so in that sense are both of you looking at illuminating people inside your your story but are you trying to force the reader to do that too or is that like a secondary thing that may or may not happen what do you what are your intentions as writers in those cases I mean, I'm I'm straight up trying to manipulate people. Like I'll, I'll <laughs> say that right now. Like like I uh, not not in a like again maybe not in an evil sense. It's like I want you to heal a thing, right? And I definitely want to put you in a position where um, it's like, yeah, I, I understand why this person did this potentially revolting thing. Sean, I I love the phrase that you used so much. I'm 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 that like something just fell into place place in my brain when you said well lit. When it's like it's a matter of lighting um, as a, as a like aesthetic choice. I think that's super super interesting um, because I think I think that you know for all its uh, very you know, 
questionable morals at times. Um, the book is very well lit in the sense that it's like you understand exactly why everybody is doing this. And that's kind of where it can get squicky because you follow along up to the point where you're like, wait, I, I've identified too far and now I'm uncomfortable. So I, I for sure am, am trying to um, use lighting to kind of lure people into a darker corner than maybe they would have gone on their own or maybe that they would have sort of thought themselves capable of internally, you know, that they sort of have like followed this thread um, either right to the end and have like had the whole experience that I like, you know, kind of laid out for them or that they reached a wall where they're like, I can no longer identify or kind of condone this like moral path i'm going to like read it for enjoyment but I, I can no longer like follow the character on this journey and that's also great right because you've discovered you've hit that wall and like that's a different kind of experience but yeah i'm i'm for sure trying to make things happen to people <laughs> <laughs> sure and I, I think that i don't know with everything i write i feel like i'm trying to um learn how to use different tools and try to write things, dif write something differently, write something I don't know how to write. And um, I'm really interested in the way some of my favorite writers can tell. I know how you can narrate and kind of force a reader's experience. You know, if you tell the reader, you know, you can write, uh, if, the, if, the character, if, if the character is really like, I don't know whether to ask the girl out or not, and like is really like, struggling with this, it's very easy to narrate that experience in such a way that the reader, you know, is nervous, is anxious as well, hopeful mm -hmm. and so on. But I'm really mesmerized by the writers who can be, who can almost have hidden what's going on. They hid it somewhere else. It's this sleight of hand mm -hmm. where they've like set the table in such a way that they can then write a story, uh, write a scene that's about, I don't know, going walking your dog and you feel the way this is deeply about whether or not the marriage is going to end this dog walking mm -hmm. scene with no, the spouse isn't even there, but you feel it. Yeah. And so I think that with this book, um, unlike what Natalie is saying, I was really in some way places trying to, you know, trying to find a way to set the table so that action scenes, and you know, this is a book that starts with a grocery store, but ends with robots chasing thieves through the desert. That when we get to that <laughs> robot chasing thief moment on motorcycles, uh, that there's like, you set the table so that that means something without mm -hmm. me having to narrate what it means to the reader. So even you pointed oh, out that question, I, that should I, should I, should I? I think when I think about it, I've slipped that in so early at the beginning of the book that, and then I don't need to come back to it. And it's almost like, I hope that by putting it early, almost casually, that that question, which is really central to so much of the narrative, mm -hmm. the reader almost forgets that it's there and but finds themselves asking themselves that later and can't remember why. I, I like what you're saying about things meaning other things. And in fact, I, I did want to make, it's, it's a wonderful opening to part of the description of the panel where they're talking about how we're also getting at metaphors that can mean different things when you're talking about good and evil in gray areas. Mm -hmm. um, it can, can you guys talk a bit about the way you approach, you know, your, your metaphors and the way you structure up symbolisms in your stories? And, or, or if you don't want to talk specifically about your craft, maybe talk about how you appreciate it in other writers. That's also legit. I think that the metaphor is really, to me, kind of central to literature. Uh, I think of like what if I try to think of what literature means as opposed to uh, I don't know other lesser or just different forms of writing. <laughs> uh, it's a it's, something is literary to me if it is a story that is also about another story. In a way, the story you're reading has to be a metaphor for another story. So maybe it's a story about yeah someone you know trying to move you know trying to survive the Arctic wastes or you know a bear is hunting this woman and it's a story about a bear being hunted i mean a woman being hunted by a bear or a bear being hunted by a woman but really you know the story that it's about is, is actually, actually i don't know resilience uh, or, or the human spirit human. or maybe something uh, less obvious and less cliched too and so uh, uh i do think it's important that a story the stories that i write i like them to be also about something else. So that's the kind of macro metaphor. And then on the micro metaphor, I think it's really tricky. It's sort of the mark of, uh, 
I find it very funny to be, I'll come home from doing an afternoon of writing and I'll see my partner and it, she'll ask what I did that afternoon. And some days it's like an hour or two will go by where all I'm doing is trying to decide which, I don't know, what tree the character sees outside or what bird lands on the window to try to find the one that really like, I don't, couldn't even explain why, but feels like it evokes the feeling I want. You know, a crow or a raven, those are obvious, but what does a, a wren say? Should it be a wren? Should it be a finch? Should it be a jay? Should it be a cardinal? I don't know. And those kind of elusive aspects of metaphors, there's like, these, everything in the world has subtle um, um, connotations or valences for us as readers. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, I really feel it's my job to try to pay attention to as much of those as possible, both in the meaning and in the sound even, um, and put those down. Natalie? Sure. Um, for, for me, it's it's really uh, rooted in vocabulary, right? So so um, in this novel, I'm working with the vocabulary of superheroes, right? And like all of the and superhero comics. And there there's an incredibly like rich, like pantheon of words to go into there. And so you can do really interesting things with um, people's names and the specific vocabularies of their powers and dig really into the, you know, the, the science of that really, really deep. Like there's a lot of like wonderful, um, specific granular language. So whenever possible, because I, I have this, um, whole massive cultural frame of reference to draw on, I do try and pull from that um, as much as possible. Uh, I was a poet before I was a fiction writer. So there's, there, I, I'm very obsessed with like vocabularies as structures. Like what, you know, like what is the vocabulary of a specific type of math? What is the vocabulary of like, you know, a, a, a particular like branch of science? So, you know, I, I, I was, um, you know, very interested in, uh, like I drew a lot of things from quantum mechanics because like it's functionally indistinguishable from magic. And also there's like, it's really fun to call people things like quantum entanglement and super collider, right? Like that, that is, that's just fun for me. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like using the, using my source material as a source of vocabulary, um, which I think bleeds across into, um, into the way that I use metaphors pretty extensively. Um, I said this before too, that I think all, all comics, especially superhero comics, um, are just playing the fairy queen over and over again, which is essentially like using people to stand in for ideas, right? Like these are all allegories. Like your name is literally for <laughs> Like you're, you're, or Captain America, and you're standing in for like, a particular idea, right? Like you're not, it's there, they are people, but more so they're the like physical anthropomorphic manifestations of a concept. Um, and like, that's, that's part of what makes, uh, what makes I think superhero stories so interesting is they're this sort of like attempt to humanize ideas. Um, so I think a lot of like a, a lot of the way that I, I kind of deal with um, both metaphor and also like intertext, like you were saying, like stories that are about other stories. Like if this is, you know, drawing on fairy tales, that means something in terms of like both emotion and tone, but also in vocabulary. Or this, if this is drawing on like superhero comics or both, like what, you know, that what is happening there with those relationships, I think is really important to me. Wow, you guys sound so smart. Um, <laughs> it's all in the when, wrist, I assure you. Yeah, it's all in the wrist. Um, when so when we're talking about gray areas and we're 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 talking about you know good and evil, right and wrong. I mean, however we want to work with those words, but I mean um, the criteria with which we judge something to be right or wrong or good or evil have been changing over time. There's stuff that in my grandfather's time was you know flat out considered evil, and it's not anymore. And and so. Uh, like, uh, how do you navigate sort of temporal shifts in 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 right and wrong when when you're approaching things like dealing with you know gray and ambiguity in your writing? I mean, sort of the joy of oh, Natalie. Oh, no, no, I was just saying it's a great question. Please go first, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I can have a moment to percolate. I'm here to ask stumpers. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's interesting in a book is um, kind of dislocating the story from one 
site to another. So, you know, it could be writing a, writing Pride and, no, I mean, I don't want to get too much into examples, but the, um, my first novel, Us Conductors, it takes place in the uh, 30s and four, uh, 20s and 30s and a bit in the 40s and um, 1920s, 30s, 40s. And um, every book kind of takes place in the present in that every book as it's read occurs in the present. And so there's something that really kind of productive, something that is added to the story just by reading a story of the past in the present. You know, any story, even, that's why the Bible, I guess, is such a, a, a rich text for so many people. Um, you can just take a, a moral problem from the past and set it now, give it to a reader who will read it now, and it suddenly has new it involves new questions and new answers. Reading 1984 or Brave New World in 2020 has different um, uh, connotations for us. And so for me, I think you don't actually, as a writer, you almost don't need to, those temporal moral changes, you don't even need to do anything with them. You don't need to highlight them. It's so self-evident to the reader mm -hmm. that uh, a character trying to decide whether to, you know, a character trying to decide whether to work with Lenin or even with Stalin as is, the case in us conductors, like it's obvious to a reader, like that a reader in 2020 feels that, like feels a friction there. Um, and so you can kind of almost let things be. Uh, I always feel like as a writer, you want to let the reader come to as many of the conclusions as you as you can. You want to come, you want, don't want to force any conclusions upon them. You want to let them come to conclusions on their own. And so that's one of those places you can kind of just set it and step back, hopefully. Um, one of the things I love about writing spec fic is that I get to invent the world. <laughs> I, get to, I, get to, I get to make it. I mean, we, we're all inventing the world, right? Like it's, yes. it's fiction. Um, so you, but in, in particular with speculative fiction of any variety, you are remaking a world that by definition can have like different rules, right? And there's not that kind of like, there isn't that same friction necessarily right that you can you know you can kind of um you can kind of create a new space um and you know i i don't uh so i i i i'm kind of like i think hench is set in sort of a present to very very near future but probably a present um but it certainly references um a lot of the events that are sort of like 15 and then maybe 30 to 40 years ago um, and kind of like the way that uh, superheroes and superheroism have evolved um, in this particular space and uh, I only engage with that in terms of a like well things have changed kind of way but ultimately like um, like kindness is universal right? Compassion is universal. And there's kind of no time in which like, if you are kind, it is not evident. And if you are being cruel, it is, you know, it's, it's not evident. Um, so I kind of, I let that conceptually be more of a, of a, um, of a compass than anything else when kind of um, dealing with, you know, with things that were in the past. I mean, also, um, like, I know that kind of our social mores have changed, but like even people in, in the past knew like it was crappy to be bigoted, right? Like there, <laughs> there have always been people that are like, hey, perhaps do not be a bigot in, in the following ways. And, and there are definitely times when it was more socially acceptable to em embody that bigotry. And you could kind of like get away with it in different ways. And like, honestly, today you, you can too, unfortunately. Like there's a lot of spaces in which a lot of awful things are socially permissible. Um, but as long as you're clear that like, here are the things that are awful, even if they are socially permissible in like a specific space, um, I think that, you know, you can, you can kind of like, um, if there's any kind of letting them be, it's that, you know, it, it's kind of like you, you, uh, you don't shy away from something like, even though this person did not suffer these immediate social consequences because of this thing, it doesn't make it less repulsive. Um, or, you know, even if this person is sort of like, 
um, you know, puts up with a lot of friction because they insist on a particular kind of kindness that doesn't change the fact that they are being kind and you kind of like, um, as long as, you know, having those structures in place, I think is much, uh, is very important, especially when you're pointing out those kinds of like temporal or cultural differences. Cool. Um, um, let, let's talk for a second about the scale of good and evil, because I think one of the things that, um, one of the criticisms brought, like I'm a big comic nerd and I continue to read comics, but one of the criticisms that's been leveled against the form is that it's all premised on, you know, uh, 13 year old boy, you know, power fantasies and, you know, the idea that punching Hitler would do something and so on, um, you know, and I, I'm exaggerating a bit for effect, but it, it's there it is. When when really um, some of the things we're confronting in society now that is that is that are making those the, the the sort of evils of the world are systemic in nature. We're talking about systematized racism or legislated, uh, you know, homophobia or stuff like that. Um, and I think you know I I thought for my own writing like how could I get at some of that? And I you know have not come to any. I haven't figured anything out. Um, and I think. Part of it is some of the the evils that are in the world are a tragedy of the commons evils, where like each person does one little thing that on its own is not a, that big a deal, but when you add them all together, suddenly there's there's a big effect. Um, are are readers ready to 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 take a work at that scale? And I mean, are writers ready to take uh, to to create works at that scale? Like, is it possible within literature, or is it too big? I mean, I'm I'm very comfortable saying that like I've basically acab the novel. Like I'm 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 like very comfortable saying that this is like a very firmly against a police state and engages with that all of the way through, um, as much as it engages with anything else, which it which is the kind of like organized and legislative as well, you know, evil as well as a as very particular kind of, of evil of the commons. Um, I, I would go so far as I think literature has to engage with that. Um, you know, not not in a like everything has to be entirely a hundred about that. Um, but you know, it, it does kind of exist in that context. Like I could not write a novel that was about superheroes, which is about like, it's really about the damage that people with power do and particularly like power that is steeped in a particular kind of violence due to the communities that they're ostensibly there to protect. And you you actually look at the damage versus the help, the damage drastically outweighs it, um, which, uh, you know, is proven in the novel with math and can be proven in life with math, it turns out as well too. Um, so like I, I'm, you know, pretty comfortable like engaging with that very very directly um i don't think the metaphors such as they are are really veiled you know they're they're just they're just kind of there um when it comes to and when it comes to like you know third old boy fantasies like fair enough uh i mean i've, I've also read comics since i was a, a kid and there's always been something for me even if there has been maybe less like there's always been um alternative comics. There have always been things that are weird. There are sort of like different ways of dreaming yourself into various spaces. Um, even though, you know, that, that might be like predominantly um, male and white and, and straight and cis, but that doesn't mean that there aren't alternatives. And it certainly doesn't mean that there aren't like um, more and different stories springing up all the time that are extremely Im important. Um, you know, which is all to say that like, Sometimes you just need to see somebody punch Hitler, though. <laughs> you know, like, like sometimes, like there, there is something super powerful about about that as well, right? Like there is a reason that all those clips of somebody just decking a Nazi on the subway go viral because, like, sometimes you just need to punch Hitler, man. And sometimes that is the answer. And sometimes, like, literature needs to punch Hitler too. Sean? Sean? That's a good there's, a, there's your tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully one of our audience members is tweeting that right now. Um, 
I, I like I like to think of writing um, fiction as about uh, using lies, fictions, using lies to say to tell something that's true. Um, and to me, I think it's really important that telling something that's true part, if the writing you're you're doing doesn't really make any statements about the world or about your experience of the world, then it's sort of hollow. And also, I think that if you're writing, it is itself kind of communicating a lie. Not, a, I mean, there's a difference between a, having a fantasy, you know, like writing a story where you're trying to dream a world that isn't here, dream a truth into being, that's something. But mm -hmm. if you're really just lying, you're not really representing the way things really are. Um, you're, you're, I think some artists sometimes try to tell a story. We can think of versions of, you know, really gross, films and books that are about real darkness and so on, but it's not an authentic representation of what that darkness is like. What it is is someone saying, maybe it feels great and has no concert. Like they're <laughs> kind of testing out a premise that they don't believe um, and is kind of gross and ugly. I don't really like that. I think that it's our responsibility to, to try to use lies to say, to express, express things it. that are true. Um, and uh, if we're doing that, if all of us do that, if every story is an expression of a different uh, perspective and set of experiences, then for me, the way that we kind of <laughs> teach readers, you know, teach something about good and evil and so on, is by readers kind of consuming lots, lots and lots and lots of different varied mm -hmm. expressions of what's true and realizing that different truths kind of conflict and uh, uh, yeah, the, run it against each other, but it's that variety, that diversity of truths that can really add up to a certain kind of moral vision of the universe. Um, and it's what I think it's actually something that fiction is really good at. Um, I mean, if you're a reader, I don't think writing necessarily makes me a better person, but I think reading does and reading fiction in particular, in some ways that nonfiction I think can't do because of the way that we don't empathize as easily um, with certain kind of nonfiction uh, stories, but others, of course, we can. Um, but fiction is really good at putting you in the mind of the characters and bringing mm -hmm. you along and kind of representing those truths. Yeah, uh, we have another audience question. I want to make sure we get to it. Uh, the question is, how do you write about a darkness that you have not personally experienced? Uh, what do you draw on for this? Either of you want to take a stab? I mean, the, that's that's an interesting interesting question in terms of like it experienced in which direction I think is important. Like if you're if you're saying like you know how can you imagine what it feels like to do a terrible thing? Um, you know I think I think that uh, short answer. There's for sure a lot of things I can't, um, but I can I can certainly like. Uh, I indulged in enough revenge fantasies that I feel like I have a fairly like <laughs> imaginative backdrop to draw upon. Um, and I can kind of like, uh, so there, there's that in a way that's almost easier um, because you can, you kind of like uh, draw on all those moments you could have been worse than you are, right? Of which we all have many. Um, and you know, in which in which you made you made a choice to kind of like move forward. Um, on the on the other side, like darkness, you have an experience in terms of like a thing that hasn't um, has not happened to you. Um, I I've never had a particularly difficult time, um, like imagining myself in those situations or a character in those situations. Um, because there, there's a lot uh, that like I I can't become kind of adjacent to you know like we've all experienced like a terrible physical pain in one way or the other right and just because a character is going through a particular experience you know that doesn't mean that um, I can't put myself in that position. Um, or a particular kind of like emotional trauma, you know, I, I, I try and find like, what is the, the most adjacent experience I can draw on from that. Um, I think like, 
A very important question, however, is to not try and speak from a perspective that is totally not yours, right? And to sort of speak to a trauma that you cannot relate to. Um, so like, I, I would go so far as to say that like, you know, I, there, there are certain kinds of stories, um, both positive and negative that like, these are stories that are not exclusively traumatic at all. Of course, there are lots and lots in this positive register, but if it's a thing I, I have no personal or emotional or cultural, um, you know, frame of reference at all, um, maybe it is not my place to tell that particular story or, or relate that particular trauma. Um, like I, I, you know, I, I would never, uh, I would never want to speak for someone um, when that's not a thing I can do authentically um, or do without appropriation. So, you know, I, I think that, I think that there's um, like, that's a really good question because like, I think, you know, as writers, we try and draw from like, as rich and varied a set of experiences as we can. And we try and dream ourselves into a lot of positions that we have not inhabited ourselves. And we have to be really vigilant not to, in the process, um, end up taking on an identity or laying claim to a narrative that isn't ours. So there, there are for sure some aspects, both dark and light, that, um, is maybe not necessarily our place to tell, but rather to kind of like um, make space for um, when it comes to comes to other voices. Well, Sean, thoughts? I was just going to say where I land on what Natalie was just talking about is a little bit. I think we're on the same side, but it's a bit different. In that, I think that it's really important that we not exploit voices. You know. Uh, it, there's that element of like taking the place of someone, especially like in our market economy or our attention economy and so on. But I don't feel like um, that one is obliged not to explore the stories of people with this experiences that are very different than mine. It just, the kind of the further afield they are, the more likely an increase in, at a certain point, like very likely it is, I'm gonna do a really shitty job. And I think that when it comes back to me, hey, you did a shitty job, that's not what it's like at all, then I'm gonna to have to eat my humble pie. Like, it, it, the, the risks are kind of, it's like, you're gonna do a bad job. If, and if you manage to do a good job, then you've done a good job. But the people who are evaluating that aren't gonna be people who are just like you. It's gonna be the people whose experiences you're trying to kind of integrate. Um, and so that's why it's safer to kind of stay away from things that you're going to do badly um, as a writer. Um, and also kind of morally better if, because of those questions of exploitation, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but on, I think that in terms of the original question about writing uh, darkness, I don't think it's very useful for me. I haven't found it very useful to kind of like, what is my near, okay, I've never been run over by a train. What is the accident that I could, that I did endure that is closest to that? Let me think about that skiing accident and try to make that a train. Like that kind of stuff doesn't prove very useful. But weirdly, actually thinking about an experience, I find uh, not very useful at all to writing or to storytelling either. Uh, I think uh, I compare it to acting. Like how does an actor act? Like how do you, uh, portray what it's like to lose a parent or, or a loved one. It's not going to be to like sit and think, like you don't come to the answer by sitting and thinking about how will I perform? perform. That? Like maybe I'll cry. Maybe at a certain point you have to just kind of like go into your body and, and, and act, right? Do it. And similarly for me, the only way that I can access and learn how to represent a darkness I haven't experienced or anything I haven't experienced mm -hmm. is to write it. Like you write, mm -hmm. you start right, you write the sentence, you're like, no, you know, you cross it out, you write it again. <laughs> that word seems, and slowly, just by kind of like narrating it into being, you try to find what feels true and right and, and navigate your way through. And you still might get it, like the, anyone else who has experienced it reads what you've written and says, that's garbage. Um, <laughs> but really the only way to embody it and to, to inscribe it is to, for me to kind of try to find the words. It's like, I have to act it to do it. Well, that's an awesome answer for both of you. Uh, I think we're at the the two fifteen mark, but I'll give each of you a split second to just say where people can find you and your books. 
Oh, sure. Uh, you want to go first, uh, Natalie? Sure. Um, I'm uh, I'm on the internet in most places um, at Natalie Z, so N A T A L I E Z E D. Um, and uh, you can find Hench um, at, uh, you know, IndieBound is a great way to find it online from your, you know, favorite indie bookstore. Um, most online retailers are carrying it um, as well as Storefront if you're comfortable. That. So m most places, I'm very happy to say you can find it. Um, but yeah, and, and and you can find on the internet most places too. Great. And how about you, Sean? You can find me at buyshawnmichaels.com and my uh, Twitter handle is swan, like the bird, swan michaels. Thanks so much. This thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you to everyone. I can't wait to go find whoever has live tweeted literature needs to punch Hitler too. Um, <laughs> definitely the highlight of my hour. I love that. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you to Derek for a wonderful job moderating this Thanks, session. Man. Thank you to Sean and Natalie for your incredible insight. Cannot wait to pick up both of your works. Um, you can find both Hench and The Wagers um, in uh, the wonderful storefronts of our friends at Baca Phoenix Books at BacaPhoenixBooks.com mm -hmm. too. So thank you all so much for uh, sharing an afternoon with us. Thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. Lovely. Take care. All right, my friends. So this concludes part one of today's Word on the Street Ideas and Imagination stream, but we're not done yet. You can rejoin us in just 10 minutes on Ideas and Imagination, part two of two. This afternoon, we'll turn more to the ideas side of things with panels on fact checking, the future of media and the public interest, and how to build a writing community through podcasting. We've also got more great content over on our books and discovery track streaming live on YouTube, just like here. The Word on the Street is funded in part by the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Toronto, and we also acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council, and Ontario Creates. Ce projet est financé en partie par le Gouvernement du Canada, le Gouvernement de l'Ontario et la Ville de Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again soon.